minutes, we have your winter survival guide. If you've ever had to walk or drive in snow, you know winter presents unique challenges. Snow and ice can make getting around tricky and downright dangerous. So do you know how to maneuver in these slippery conditions? We head back to driver's ed for some potentially life-saving lessons. Winter sports can be fun, and with the right equipment and precautions, you can avoid a trip to the emergency room. And don't spend a fortune cranking up the heat. A look at the hacks and tips to keep costs down while staying warm. Plus, despite the cold temps, you can still find hot deals. But first, some tools and appliances you should have around the house for the winter months. Freezing temperatures, snow and ice, all making for dangerous conditions during the winter. What are the most common injuries when winter comes around? And I'm in the emergency room in Colorado where we typically see a lot of winter injuries. And probably the biggest one are people slipping and falling on ice. In 2019 alone, fall-related injuries sent more than 8 million Americans to the emergency room. They'll hurt their backs, they'll hurt their heads, they'll hurt their shoulders. To avoid slipping and falling, make sure you have shoes with traction. If you have to brave the snow and ice, walk like a penguin. Slightly point your feet out and bend your knees, extend your arms out to your sides for balance, and take short steps or shuffle. Every year, snow shoveling causes thousands of injuries and about 100 deaths, most caused by heart attacks. Something as simple as shoveling snow can actually be fairly dangerous. It's a very, very strenuous workout. So even though they're feeling the symptoms, they're feeling chest pain, they're feeling shortness of breath, they have this goal of a driveway they want to clear, so they keep moving forward. Symptoms of a heart attack can include chest discomfort, shortness of breath, even nausea. Besides taking frequent breaks, push the snow instead of lifting it. If you must lift, only partially fill the shovel so it's lighter. And remember to use your legs, not your back. Also, consider using an ergonomic shovel like this one to avoid back injuries. Snowblowers can save you time and energy when clearing snow, but they can also cost you a trip to the hospital. On average, nearly 6,000 injuries result from snowblowers each year. According to the Consumer Product Safety Commission, most snowblower injuries happen when someone tries to clear snow from the discharge chute. First, stop the engine. Use a long stick, not your hands, to unclog the machine. Add fuel when the engine is cold and do it in a well-ventilated area outdoors. Remember, never run your snowblower in a shed or a garage because of carbon monoxide dangers. Known as the silent killer, every year carbon monoxide poisoning kills hundreds and sickens thousands more. A majority of the deaths occurring between November and February, when many use portable generators for warmth. Your home can contain other potential sources for carbon monoxide, including a fireplace if it's not well ventilated and working properly. That's why you want to make sure you have enough of these carbon monoxide detectors installed throughout your house. If you plan to use a space heater in your home, don't get burned. As the name suggests, give the heater some space. Keep it at least three feet away from anything flammable like this dog bed and always plug it directly into the wall, never a power strip. And if you do have to brave the elements, make sure you dress in layers and don't forget about your four-legged family members, especially if your dog has a short coat like Moose here, get him a sweater or a parka. And don't forget the booties. It's a fetching and functional look. Booties protect your dog's paws from the cold, salt, and other irritants. But try telling that to Moose. Good boy, it takes a little getting used to, huh? He kept the coat on, booties not so much. All right, joining us now with more on staying safe and healthy in this frigid weather, NBC News senior medical correspondent, Dr. John Torres, a favorite of our show. Hey, Dr. Torres, so good to see you. You're an ER doc in Colorado. You're no stranger to snowy weather. First, talk to us about what's the best way for us to dress in layers to stay, home, stay warm without overheating. Yeah, this is important because you want to make sure you stay warm, but if you get too warm, you can work with that as well. So you want to dress in three layers, basically. Number one, the base layer underneath. You want something that's synthetic. It's a synthetic material that can wick away the moisture, and that way it doesn't build up and start freezing your body. The middle layer should provide some insulation. We're talking sweaters, sweatshirt, fleece. All those work really well for this type of thing. And then the outdoor layer is the one you want to block the wind and the rain. Now, all of these layers should be loose. That'll help trap in warm air and they should be layers that you can take off and put back on depending on your body temperature because you don't want to sweat in the middle of the winter. But also don't forget socks, gloves, and hat, extremely important, Vicki. Yeah, walking my kids to school here in the Northeast, I know that when any part of your skin is exposed <laughs> to the cold, it can be so painful. How do you know when it's serious, like if you have frostbite? 
So one of the things you have to remember about frostbite is the areas that don't have much circulation are the ones that are going to be affected the most. And we have a little rhyme. It's fingers, nose, ears, and toes. Those are the ones that are going to get frostbitten first. So if you start getting pain, especially if it starts intensifying and you start getting that tingling pain, it starts getting worse. And especially if it starts going away, those are signs that you need to seek immediate medical attention. Now, if they're just tingling a little bit, you get back inside, you can put them in warm and not hot water. Think of the same water you give a baby a bath in and that can bring the feeling back but if that feeling gets super intense or does or suddenly goes away you need to be checked especially if you notice any blistering vicky oh fingers ears nose and toes got it all right what about hypothermia what are the warning signs and symptoms for that so hypothermia is when your body core temperature starts dropping and your body does what it can to build up the heat. So it's going to start shivering and that shivering is going to be light. We've all experienced that, but then it can start becoming uncontrollable. If that happens, you need to get inside. If you can't get inside, you need to wrap yourself with as many layers as possible, particularly get out of the wind. And if you're with somebody and they start getting confused, that's a medical emergency. You want to make sure they get treated as soon as possible. And last quick question, Dr. John, things happen we don't expect, so what should we do to prepare for a winter weather emergency when we're out there? So one of the things you want to prepare for is make sure you have a go bag, and that go bag has the things in it you need that you need to survive over the next couple of days. You know, things like important documents, extra set of house keys, some cash in case you need cash, mm -hmm. things you can eat and drink, water, non-perishable foods, have a flashlight, have a hand-cranked radio can definitely help. Take your medications, toiletries. If you have a cell phone, make sure you take your charger as well. And then a first aid kit, some extra blankets, warm clothing, hand warmers, those things that can help you survive for a couple of days because you never know when that's going to happen. And I know that you think about this often, but if you have pets, they're going to need a go bag too, Vicki. All right, two go bags. That was great advice. Always good to see you. Thank you, Dr. Torres. <laughs> you bet. Our winter survival guide continues. We'll show you how to stay warm without breaking the bank. Plus, we're heading to driving school for a look at how to safely maneuver on slick, icy, and snowy roads. Also, we'll have your safety guide to winter fun. From sledding to skiing, Consumer Confidential is coming right back. NBC News, streaming free now. For Dateline Premium, subscribe now on Apple Podcasts. It's the best time of the morning. Time for the pop star, baby. I'm feeling the vibe today on the show. We begin tonight with breaking news just coming in. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. What do people need most right now? Did the state and or law enforcement drop the ball? Migrant families now stranded in Mexico. What's the World Cup experience been like? It's your news playlist. Top story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. We begin tonight with breaking news just coming in. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News. Streaming free now. For Dateline Premium, subscribe now on Apple Podcasts. What do people need most right now? Did the state and or law enforcement drop the ball? Migrant families now stranded in Mexico. What's the World Cup experience been like? It's your news playlist. Top story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Winter weather can cause dangerous driving conditions from slick and icy roads to ending up stuck in a ditch or a snowbank. That happened to me once. But a little preparation and know-how can help you literally steer your way out of a snowy mess. It's winter and that can mean situations like this. Cars slipping and sliding all over the road and drivers stranded. In January, thousands of motorists spent 24 hours stuck on a stretch of I-95 in Virginia. Of course, the safest option is to stay off the roads when it's snowy and icy, but sometimes that's not possible. So I'm heading back to driver's ed to get a refresher on how to drive in the winter. Aliyah Borelli owns the AP Driving School in New Jersey and has 10 years of experience as a licensed instructor. Aliyah, what's the first thing we need to know before we hit the road in the winter? So the first thing you want to do is know what kind of conditions you're driving into and winterize your car for those conditions. That means clear off the snow and check to ensure your tires are roadworthy. Use the penny trick. If you can see the top of Lincoln's head, that means your tread is worn and you may need new tires. 
And there are a few must-have items to keep in your car. You want to definitely have some kind of blanket in a pack that can stay dry. Okay. We also have some snacks and some water. Mm -hmm. A remote jump start that is a pack that can jump start your car if you need to jump and you don't need to have another car around. She also recommends a head mounted flashlight. And this one I like because you can strap it onto your head in case you need to find maybe if you drop your keys or if you need to change a tire. And she says always keep your tank at least half full in case you get stranded and need heat. With our winter supplies ready, it's time to get a driving lesson. When you are driving in icy conditions, what should you keep in mind? So the first thing you want to do is you want to reduce your speed. She says the speed limit is only for optimal conditions. In the winter, slow down and give yourself 150 feet to come to a full stop. You're increasing your reaction time and you're increasing the car's reaction time to different terrain. Mm -hmm. Borelli says the old rule of pumping your brakes no longer applies. Most cars today have anti-lock brake systems. The computer chip in the car is pumping your brakes for you. Let's say I hit an icy patch. What should I do? Should I hit the brakes? So you don't want to hit the brakes. You don't want to change that momentum that that car has already too quickly. You want to come off the accelerator and you want to regain control of the car. Let's say the back of my car starts to skid to the left. What do I do? What you want to do is first remain calm and come off of your accelerator. Then you want to adjust your steering wheel very gently to the left. You're okay. turning your steering wheel in the direction that the back of the car is skidding. She says by doing that, you're preventing the car from going into a spin. What if you do slide off the road and get stuck? Let's say we've run into a snowbank. What's the first thing we need to think about? So the first thing you want to do is make sure that you are visible. If you have some flares, now's the time to use them. Okay, make sure you read the instructions for how to light the flare and place the first one about eight paces away from your car. And the second one about 40 paces away. This is to give other cars enough distance to see you and react. No flares? Borelli says don't use hazard lights, which blink. Instead, use your parking lights. Here's the symbol. They'll keep your lights solid, which indicates to drivers you've come to a stop. It sounds strange, but keeping kitty litter in the car could save you. A little kitty litter right behind your tires might give you that extra traction that you need to get unstuck from your spot. You can also use your car's floor mat. Some easy tips and tools to help you out of an icy jam. Another tip, if it is foggy, avoid turning on your brights. The light will actually bounce off the fog and make it harder to see. Instead, slow down to increase your reaction time. Use your fog lights instead. Those beams actually point down and make it easier to see the road. As for tire chains or studded snow tires, experts say use those in mountainous or very snowy areas, but in most cases, they're not necessary. Some states even ban them, except under extreme conditions, because they can damage the roads. All right, well, don't let a day of fun end with a trip to the emergency room. Your safety checklist for winter sports from skiing to ice skating to sledding. How to tell if you're pushing your body too hard. And later, money matters. The deals you can discover during the winter months. Consumer Confidential returns after this short break. We begin tonight with breaking news just coming in. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. No stress, no mess, just yum. That's it. NBC News, streaming free now. This is what it looks and feels like. The, the bigger piece of the puzzle. We begin puzzle. tonight with breaking news. How much water ultimately will be forced inland? Whenever it happens, wherever you are. NBC News, streaming free now. NBC News, streaming free now. We begin tonight with breaking news just coming in. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. No stress, no mess, just yum. That's it. I think when you open your eyes, you get to decide, how's my day going to be? We want to be a way to start your day. Lighten your load every single morning. What do people need most right now? Did the state and or law enforcement drop the ball? Migrant families now stranded in Mexico. What's the World Cup experience been like? It's your news playlist. Top story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now.
NBC News, streaming free now. It's the best time of the morning. Time for that pop star, baby. I'm feeling the vibe today on the show. NBC News, streaming free now. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. No stress, no mess, just yum. That's it. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The winter months can mean a flurry of seasonal activities from hitting the slopes to grabbing the sleds, even lacing up your ice skates. While it's great to get your heart pumping and take advantage of the cold weather fun, make sure you brush up on the basics to avoid a trip to the emergency room. From Olympic athletes to everyday thrill seekers, winter sports take many to new heights, but not without the risk of serious injury. They're so enthralled by the sport that they forget about the injury risk. Dr. Wimi Diogi is an orthopedic surgeon who serves as director of sports medicine at MedStar Washington Hospital Center in Washington, D.C. Is this the busiest time of year for a doctor like yourself? For ski-related, uh, snowboard-related injuries, absolutely. In 2020, skiing resulted in more than 23,000 visits to the ER. Snowboarding, another 19,000. That's why safety experts say when it comes to taking the right precautions, there are just some things you just shouldn't let slide, like making sure you have the proper gear. What are some of the most common injuries? There's a large number of concussions, lacerations, fractures. It's really important to wear a helmet when you're, you're performing these sports. Before hitting the slopes, Dr. Duogi says, be honest about your skill level. Don't attempt a double black diamond if you've only experienced a bunny hill. And for those over age 40, he suggests scheduling a checkup with your doctor. You're gonna be doing activities that are gonna test your aerobic and anaerobic fitness. You need to get an expert's consultation to make sure that you're healthy before you jump out there. As ski and snowboard injuries reach their peak, keeping doctors busy, this time of year also has ski shops like this one in high demand. One of the keys to staying safe on the slopes, selecting the right equipment. The first hill to climb, dressing the part. Start by wearing several light and loose layers, followed by an outer layer that's wind and water resistant, like these snow bibs. Focus on fit. Lisa Ski NYC store manager Charlie Marone says find an adjustable helmet. Look for the knobs in the back. A lot of ski helmets, the newer ones have knobs that you can tighten it. Like a nice yeah. snug fit. Right. What's next? Next you want goggles. You want to make sure they fit your face right. You want to cover the sides as well. Let's get to the skis now. What do we need to know? You want to get the right size. Typically for beginners, we want to be under the chin because the shortest ski is easier to ski with. And then you want to look at the width here. Wider ski, easier to navigate as well. How about the boots? You want to get the right size, it's very important. You want to be a snug fit, you want to hug your foot. Because boots mold to your feet, Marone recommends buying new rather than used. When you do used boot, you don't know what foot's been in it. It wouldn't fit your foot correctly. Once you have your boots properly fitted, make sure an expert has set your bindings according to your height, weight, and ability so that the skis will release and prevent injury if you have a bad fall. And because so many winter activities combine high speed and slick surfaces, you can't skate around the risk of falling. But you can learn a safer way to take a tumble. If you lose your balance while ice skating, try to land on your behind or you'll have the best cushioning. And avoid putting your hands on the ice, especially at a crowded rink where another skater's blade could cut you. Sledding, a popular winter pastime for children, also sends thousands to the ER each year. Do you recommend wearing a helmet when kids are tubing or sledding? You can never go wrong wearing a helmet. For added protection, kids should also avoid sledding head first and stick to hills free of obstacles with plenty of room at the bottom. Avoid those that end in a street or a body of water. A guide to help you and your family enjoy the ride this winter. Looks fun, but before you take part in any winter sports, warm up cold muscles with light exercise or stretching, stay hydrated, and avoid overexerting yourself. Dr. Duogi says skiers tend to suffer knee injuries, while snowboarders often injure their internal organs like their kidneys, liver, and spleen. So take it easy and listen to your body. The doctor told us he can't even count the number of patients who got hurt on that one last run.
All right, still to come, money matters from the best deals available during the winter months to cutting your home heating costs. Much more when Consumer Confidential returns. What do people need most right now? Did the state and or law enforcement drop the ball? Migrant families now stranded in Mexico. What's the World Cup experience been like? It's your news playlist. Top story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. We begin tonight with breaking news just coming in. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News. Streaming free now. Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. It's the best time of the morning. Time for the pop start, baby. Oh, I'm feeling the vibe today on the show. We begin tonight with breaking news just coming in whenever it happens. Wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. You might notice an increase in your home heating bill. The U.S. government has said the cost of heating your home could rise as much as 54% because of inflation. But there are some easy ways you can save money while still staying warm. Here with us is Amy Matthews. She's a general contractor and home improvement expert. Hey, Amy, what are some ways that we can cut down on our winter heating bills this season while still staying safe and cozy? Yes, absolutely. Well, my goal for people is for number one, them to understand their house better. And number two, to increase their comfort while decreasing their cost. And there's a lot of really easy ways that you can go about that without doing anything new or purchasing anything. And first of all, turn down the thermostat. I know it sounds really, really simple, but uh, the Department of Energy will say that they're going to assume you're going to bring your heating bill down by 1% uh, for each degree you turn the temperature down. Ooh. That ends up being a lot because if you turn your temperature down from seven to 10 degrees, either when you're sleeping or when you're away, that's an immediate savings on your energy bill by 10%. So that's awesome. Um, another thing that you want to do is you don't want to heat rooms that you're not in. So let's okay. say uh, if it's a child's room during the day when they're not there or a playroom or an area that you're not using, close the vents to that space so you're not spending money on those kind of things. Um, there's a lot of other areas that we lose heat and that's going to be through windows and doors mostly. So take a look around your house and check for leaks. See if, there, if you can feel any drafts by any windows or doors because there's easy fixes for those. Um, and then of course the ceiling fans are something that people think of using during the summer but during the winter if you reverse them and turn them on clockwise you're not getting a breeze you're actually pulling the air you're creating a, a convection so you're pulling the air up and then pushing it back down the sides of the room so that way you're taking that hot air that gets stuck at the top back down to where you feel it in the space which is great so there's a, there's, there's so, so many more I, yeah great tips those are all free easy to do you make a little air fryer out of your room with that ceiling fan amy thank you what Absolutely. about insulation how do we figure out if our homes are properly insulated well, you want to take a look up in your attic for sure to get started because just like we put on a hat in the winter so we hold the heat in anywhere that we're losing air upstairs in our attic it, you're literally sending money through the roof so if you've got an attic take a peek up there see if your insulation needs to be uh, updated fixed if it's in uh, you know it gets it squishes over time um, and you want to be able to add insulation there so that you're not losing um, heat through the roof um, and then also check your 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 walls if you're in a really old home you may have shredded newspaper in your walls that is mm. your insulation and there are ways to fix and update that it's not a quick and easy and cheap fix but it is possible and if you're doing a renovation it's a really great time to consider where you're pulling uh, walls down where you're renovating and if you can add extra insulation at that time it's a good time to do it well oh, that's good to think about and you can eyeball it in the attic at least and then quickly talk to us about Absolutely. the bottom line if you do this heating audit of your house and then you implement some of these tips how much do you think people can save well, you know, right off the bat, like I mentioned, turning down your thermostat is a big one. Getting a programmable mm -hmm. thermostat, that's going to save you a ton of money as well. If you add all these little different hacks in, I'm aiming for people to get about a 25% savings on wow. their heating bill. And it's totally doable. But you have to just walk through the house, possibly do an energy audit to invest in one of mm -hmm. those. is a great way to understand your house better and know where you're having uh, the leakage. So then you can pinpoint it because every house is totally different. Mm -hmm. But if you can add up to 25% to by, you know, like cutting down on all these different things, um, you're going to see a big savings and that money goes right back in your pocket. Love it. Thank you. Very important and to be deliberate about it. Amy Matthews, thank you. Good to have you. Thanks so much.
Up next, where to find the deals during the winter months, a look at what to buy and how to find those discounts. Consumer Confidential, we'll be right back. NBC News, streaming free now. No stress, no mess, just yum. That's it. We begin tonight with breaking news just coming in. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. For Dateline Premium, subscribe now on Apple Podcasts. No stress, no mess, just yum. That's it. It might be cold outside, but there are still plenty of hot deals to get your hands on during the winter season. Supply chain issues and inflation have continued to affect the prices of everything from household items to groceries, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Meats, poultry, fish and eggs up 12.5%. Fruits and vegetables up 5%. Furniture and bedding jumped 13.8%. Women's dresses, jewelry, and watches costing you about 8% more. And if you've been to the store, you know it. Consumers having a much harder time finding deals in the marketplace. But luckily, we have shopping expert Trey Bodge with us today. She's going to break down everything you need to know about what to buy right now. Trey, so good to see you. Let's get right into it. After a really tough holiday season with shipping delays and price hikes, I think everyone was really ready for a clean slate in this new year. But it just feels like we can't catch a break. So what's your thought? How much longer are we going to see these high prices and supply chain issues? It's so hard to say, Vicki, just because we are still seeing these supply chain issues. Some of them are sorting out, but some of them aren't, especially anything with a chip in it. We are seeing delays mm. there, cars, electronics, things like that. I mean, the good news for consumers is that some of the merchandise is coming in and it's almost too much merchandise at this point. So we might find unexpected sales, which I always like to see. There's a degree of unpredictability. All right, well, this obviously hasn't been a standard year for those sales, but there are deals still out there. So what's your best advice for where shoppers can find those discounts and what should people be looking to buy now if they need these items? Sure. So winter apparel will be on clearance. So for instance, if your coat is old, you need a new one, or if your ca your hat isn't warm enough, those are good things to look for. You should find clearance level deals there. And then there are certain periods in the month that I really like for saving. So for instance, we're going close to Valentine's Day. If you're looking for jewelry, we often see deals on jewelry or anything Valentine's Day themed. It's also good to wait until right after Valentine's Day and you get clearance level deals there. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a Super Bowl coming up. The big game is a great time to invest in new TV if you need that or entertaining items like food, platters, glasses. And then we have President's Day. And you mentioned that big price increase on furniture and bedding. We should mm -hmm. see some deals mm -hmm. in that category. So that'll be exciting to see too. Oh, well, that's a great rundown for us. What are things that we want, might want to wait to buy right now? Sure, so I would wait on electronics because again, we are seeing that chip shortage and they're not typically on sale in February anyway, aside from TVs. And so mm -hmm. I would wait if you can until June for that category. I would also wait on spring apparel. You may see some teaser deals, but it's not gonna be anything substantial until later in the season. And then I would say toys too, because they were just on sale in December. Mm -hmm. So you're not gonna find good deals there. All right, kids, wait on the toys. When it comes to groceries, that's such a big part of all of our budgets, and it's not something that we can put off. Give us some simple strategies to use to stretch our money. Right, so you may need to go back to menu planning if you've left it behind. Look at the circulars that are in your mailbox. Go to deal sites to see if there are deals. I am seeing a lot of deals, especially on delivery services for food. Mm -hmm. And so that's a good way to strategize and save maybe 15% off, 20% off. That's a good way to go with your menu planning. And then buy in bulk when it makes sense, only on those items that you are sure that you will go through, especially if you have a bigger family. Smart shopping expert, Trey Bodge. Always good to see you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Vicki. And that is our time for now. For all of us at NBC News, I'm Vicki Wynn. Be sure to join me for another edition of Consumer Confidential right here on Today All Day. In the meantime, stay warm and safe. You scream, I, okay, I'm gonna stop right there because I know you know how it goes. We are here 
at New York City's legendary Lexington Candy Shop. Happens to be my neighborhood luncheonette. And there was a time when soda fountains and diners like this were all over New York City and all over the country. Whether it's a cone, a sundae, or mm, an ice cream float. I gotta tell you, there's nothing that brings back memories like places like these. Today, we're getting the scoop and diving into the history of America's beloved sweet shops. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're gonna learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. It's no coincidence that here at the Lexington Candy Shop, one of New York City's most iconic soda fountains, they serve ice cream from the city of brotherly love. It's Bassett's, the oldest ice cream company in America. In fact, Philadelphia is home to many early ice cream innovations. And at the Franklin Fountain, we've got two brothers who have recreated a turn of the century fountain that celebrates Philadelphia's unique contribution to American ice cream history. We're very proud to be called Soda Jerks. In the heyday of soda fountains, being called a jerk was a good thing. A soda jerk is someone that jerks the handle on the soda fountain. We are the Burley Brothers. I'm Ryan. And I'm Eric Burley. Welcome. Come on in. Stepping into the Franklin Fountain is like time traveling to a bygone era. I've always felt a kinship for the turn of the century. It just feels like maybe I was there in a past life. The Burley family originally purchasing this historic property in 2002, but they weren't sure what to do with the storefront until inspiration struck. The building is really what inspired us uh, to do what we do here. It was built around 1899, and the original tin ceiling remains as well as the penny tile floor. So we really thought that a soda fountain kind of looked right for the space. There's certainly a sense of awe and wonder, sort of a, a transport through the time machine when you walk in the door, and that was really intentional. The brothers working for nearly two years to restore the space. It is not for the faint of heart to restore any old building. It's a labor of love. And frankly, we wouldn't have it any other way. It's part of the handmade nature of everything that we do here. The kitchen itself was a preservation element, restoring the motor on the buttercream machine, fixing the belts. You know, the restoration of the building wasn't just the facade, but it's also the back of house spaces. They also embarked on a mission to recreate an authentic fountain experience. We took a number of road trips, in part to learn about the ice cream business, and then we would always pair soda fountain tours with those. So visiting places in the American South, going down to New Orleans, going to Savannah, seeing these old-fashioned soda fountain places, interviewing the soda jerks, the pharmacists, and really learning the culture of the soda fountain was a big part of our research. Today, while we may take the simple pleasure of eating an ice cream cone for granted, that wasn't always the case. I'm Sarah Lohman. I'm a food historian, author, and ice cream expert. Let's go back to when ice cream was a luxury, largely available to only the richest of Americans. We don't think of these as expensive ingredients today, but ice and sugar historically were very rare, and so only the wealthiest people could afford them. So it was usually made in the home, and by home I mean a large grand estate, by people who had servants, and then eventually people who owned other people. We're talking about the enslaved. So you also needed that literal manpower to make it. That all begins to change in the 19th century as technology and supplies change. Traditionally, European ice cream was made with a custard base that included eggs. But a simpler style emerged in Philadelphia. I think Philadelphia is the most important city to ice cream history, maybe Pennsylvania as a whole, because we had the invention of Philadelphia style ice cream by a black man. Augustus Jackson, a black man who was a White House chef, 
working under multiple presidents, including Andrew Jackson, is credited with advancing a new type of ice cream and method. And he came up with an ice cream base that didn't use eggs, but was just as like creamy and luscious, but could be made with less ingredients, made quicker. And he supposedly had really, really tasty flavors too. A free man. He later moved back to his native Philadelphia to start his own business. So he made it and sold it, but then he also sold it to other ice cream shops too, and became very famous and very wealthy for this new style of ice cream. Jackson's contributions made ice cream more widely available to more consumers. Philadelphia is also home to the oldest ice cream company in America, Bassett's. I'm Alex Bassett Strange, was my great, great, great grandfather that started this company all the way back in 1861. We're proud to be here today. Bassett was the first merchant to sign a lease in Philadelphia's historic Reading Terminal Market. And the family is still there serving up scoops today. Bassett's ice cream is a 16.5% butterfat ice cream, and it's what's called a Philadelphia style, which means that it's made without any egg yolk. Innovations to ice cream production, allowing more shops like Bassett's to open up in the early 1900s, and that ushered in a new type of meeting place where folks could socialize. And then we also had ice cream saloons. Now, the name there is key, saloon, yeah, it means bar. And at this time, bars were places where only men could go, but ice cream saloons were one of the first public spaces that was socially acceptable for women to go to. So to have a public space was really meaningful to women. To have a space where you felt free, to have a space where you could safely flirt. Soda fountains and parlors became even more popular and almost necessary during the 1920s. When prohibition hits and we ban the sale of alcohol, then there's really a need for these public spaces for people to gather and socialize outside of the home. And as we move into the soda fountain era, we have a lot of creativity in adding ice cream to different flavors of soda and making these incredible concoctions and sundaes. If you were a soda jerk at the turn of the century, you were kind of a local celebrity. Today, the jerks in charge at Franklin Fountain are serving up nostalgia along with their vintage creations. It's one of our newer uh, soda syrups. It's uh, made with real watermelon fruit. Come over here to our 1905 soda fountain. Yeah. Mm, that is really good. Uh, you know, I don't want to mess with that flavor too much, so I'll just go with vanilla. Uh, vanilla ice cream just rounds everything out nice, plays nice at the playground. And the bean specs on the vanilla show that it's made with real vanilla, not vanillin. And that's an old Philadelphia tradition of having bean specs in their vanilla ice cream. Franklin Fountain's menu focuses on classics, but they also bring back long forgotten flavors. Summer hits like black walnut that tend to be kind of bitter, but mixed with enough sweetness can be really unique and good. Other flavors like pawpaws, which are our native fruit here in North America. While others misses. Uh, a flavor that kind of bombed here, uh, as an example, I'll tell you, it was orange pineapple. Like we really wanted to bring back orange pineapple as an ice cream, which was really popular at the turn of the century. But the Burleys aren't just passionate about their flavors. They are working to keep a tasty tradition alive. Our business has really enabled the preservation of a couple of historic buildings here on the block. And we hope that the, the fountain and the institution of the soda fountain continues and you know can be passed to succeeding generations of uh, soda jerks. Coming up, I visit a family-owned ice cream shop in Harlem and get a sweet surprise. How many of you were up there? At least like 11. How real is this going back to the moon? Thank you, Lester. For Dateline Premium, subscribe now on Apple Podcasts. You get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love yeah, I love you too. <laughs> How many of you were up 
there. At least like 11. How real is this going back to the moon? Thank you, Mr. You get one beautiful life to live. What are you going to do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world to me. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm going to go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the I way. love riding. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Oh, yeah, I love you too. <laughs> For breaking news in our changing world, Download the NBC News app. Finish this sentence. Ice cream is... Love. Ice cream is not easy to make. <laughs> and see. Yeah. We're up here in Harlem where the forecast is partly cloudy with a 100% chance of sprinkles. Why? Because we're outside Sugar Hill Creamery, where they're bringing the community together one scoop at a time. Let's check it out. Hey guys, nice to meet you. Hi, How it's nice are to you? meet you. That's Nick and Petrushka Larson, husband and wife, and parents to Isla, Zadie, and Nico. So let's talk ice cream. They're also the owners of Harlem's Sugar Hill Creamery which the couple opened in their beloved neighborhood in 2017. We're gonna give you the scoop, Al. Bam! For the couple, that bam moment came after meeting up with friends in DC for some premium scoops. We had small batch delicious ice cream, and that is when it hit us that this was not an experience that we could have in our own neighborhood. The realization that they couldn't do this in Harlem was the beginning of their sweet journey. When Nick and I started dating, he always said he wanted to own a food establishment of some sort. And then this, you know, moment in life kind of presented the opportunity. Patricia oversees the shop's marketing and business, while Nick, well, he develops their artisanal flavors, often looking to the neighborhood for inspiration. The great thing about having a small shop, you see it in real time, oh yeah, they don't like this, <laughs> right? And, and our, you know, and our friends from Harlem, they are not shy to be like, yo, no, no, yeah. this is no yeah. good. <laughs> so your flavors are nods to Harlem. To the, nods the, to Harlem, nods to our respective cultures as well. So my, I'm black, African-American, and from the Caribbean, and Nick is from the Midwest and was raised on a farm. We're channeling Harlem, we're channeling childhood memories, we're channeling the way that we were raised, what we were eating. I think this is the best uh, example of channeling our neighborhood. So we have a, a, a flavor called Cafe Tuba, and where the first location is, it's like a few blocks from Little Senegal. The flavor Cafe Tuba uses coffee from Senegal. We incorporate peanut brittle and the lean pepper brownies. So it's a bit of a twist on a classic, which we like to say we make you know, twists on classics and then all their flavors that you wouldn't expect. Many features of the scoop shop pay homage to Harlem, starting with the name. Where we're sitting right now is a neighborhood that is adjacent to Sugar Hill. Sugar Hill is a neighborhood in Harlem that at the turn of the 20th century was the, the place where upwardly mobile black people resided and, and came to, right? It was also the home of the Harlem Renaissance too. Many artists, activists were living here. You know, you talk about the history and homages to this neighborhood. Uh, was there some thoughts about the, that historic uh, ice cream shop, Bumford's? Yes! Just before opening Sugar Hill, Patrushka learned about an iconic Harlem institution, Tomford's. A small group of octogenarian Harlemites that just happened to be at this conference, and they were like, hey, she's opening an happy ice cream shop. This is crazy. And you're like, oh my gosh, It'll, it's like Tomford. Tomford's was in business from 1903 to 1983, located in the heart of Harlem at 125th and St. Nicholas. Unlike many early soda fountains, it catered to black patrons, providing much more than food and ice cream. It was the place that people went after, you know, church uh, on a date. And we didn't know about it when we decided to open the shop. But after we learned about it, before we opened the shop, we definitely channeled the, the history and spirit of that place here. Sugar Hill's motto, the sweet life is a love affair between community and food. And it also has 
a historical meaning. The sweet life is also you know, a reference to the Great Migration. You know, when people moved to Sugar Hill, they were looking forward to sweet life. We wanted to give our neighbors a little bit of sweet life as well, right? Nick and Petrushka are hopeful that their spot will become the place for making family memories down the line. Later down the line is to hear stories like people talking about Tom Birds that are talking about what, you know, what we meant to them, right? To be a place where somebody could come in and say, my parents met here. What an honor. And I think I don't think that we take our role as, you know, the people who created this company lightly. Like, it is such an honor to be able to serve our neighbors and to also be a place that they continue to come back to. I think that a lot of us have really fond memories of going with our family um, and having ice cream on a hot summer day, or like rolling past a rural ice cream stand and it's just like packed with little league kids. Or when you live in a city, you've got your local ice cream place that you can walk to and the whole neighborhood is there. And as for the future of Sugar Hill Creamery? With, with three kids, uh, Nick, are, are you hoping that out of those three, one of them is going to carry on the tradition? It's a tricky question. Yes, I would, but you know, I'm not going to pressure them. At the very least, we need them to work here during exactly. high school. Exactly. Okay? <laughs>
and uh, poured the beer in it, blended it up, and then made it like a custard with, uh, with eggs. Wow. A lot goes into that. A lot goes into it. And a lot goes into forming the perfect scoop. But picture perfect scoops wouldn't be the same without one very important invention. The ice cream scoop was invented by a black man. Alfred Crawley holds a patent for the ice cream mold and disher. And that's the scoop that's like, it has a little handle that you squeeze and the thing scrapes and the ice cream plops out. Uh, but he invented that in 1897 and sort of revolutionized ice cream culture. So the side here is to form it, the tip is to like kind of scrape it, right? So if you're like just learning, the best way is just a little bit at the top, like that. Sides and boom. And you, you form it with the side. Oh, right? so you're forming the ball. The ball, the yeah, exactly. All right, voila. Ta da! Right. So the cup, got a little rinse. A rinse. Okay, so you, you start. You can well, also uh, grab out the sides there too because oh, it's a little, little softer. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a sad yeah. scoop. No, 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 look, now it. you're gonna form oh, it. Oh, now it's forming. Now you're, mm -hmm. now it's forming. Oh, yep, look, at, look that at that now. Oh, See? hey, now we're talking. There it is. Wow. There it That's is. Good. Hey, now. All right, let's taste. All, All right. right, time to taste. The Al Roker. Cheers. Well, actually. Oh, we also have a special name for it. Oh, what's that? It's uh, your neck of the woods. Oh, I like it. Get it. <laughs> wow. And this, this is, is great. Yeah. Like all Sugar Hill flavors, there's an art to naming the ice cream. For example, their best-selling blueberry cheesecake? Well, it's named for Petrushka. So this is uh, named after my wife, who's the chairperson of the board. She's the boss. This is the boss flavor. Smart man. <laughs> this, is the, this is the chief. Ooh, that's good. Yeah. Mm. My work here is done. Coming up, a whimsical creamery in Las Vegas, known for its colorful creations. You get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love ya. <laughs> love you too. For Dateline Premium, subscribe now on Apple Podcasts. You get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love ya. Love you too. <laughs> what do people need most right now? Did the state and or law enforcement drop the ball? Migrant families now stranded in Mexico. What's the World Cup experience been like? It's your news playlist. Top story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. This is what it looks and feels the latest film? The bigger piece of the puzzle. We begin tonight with breaking news. How much water ultimately will be forced inland? Whenever it happens, wherever you are. NBC News. Streaming free now. It's the best time of the morning, time for the pop star, baby. Oh, I'm feeling the vibe today on the show. For Dateline Premium, subscribe now on Apple Podcasts. It's the best time of the morning, time for the pop star, baby. Oh, I'm feeling the vibe today on the show. You know the old saying, what happens in Vegas doesn't always stay in Vegas, especially when it comes to a hot spot that's known for creating really cool desserts, cream berry. These folks are recreating the ice cream parlor experience for a whole new generation of ice cream fans. And whether that's in person or via social media posts. Selfie anyone? I've seen some kids who can kill the burrito by themselves. Most adults, it's funny, they would share. <laughs> in Las Vegas, a few miles off the strip, is the flashy, fabulous, and insta-famous ice cream shop Creamberry, opened in 2016 by husband and wife team Danny and Rosalina C, hoping to create a one-stop dessert cafe. We set on a mission to bring in a wide variety of crazy, innovative desserts into one place. For Danny, it was a dream come true. I've always had a sweet tooth when I was younger, and I've always loved ice cream. Rosalina, not so much right away. She favored traditional icy desserts from her native Indonesia, not American ice cream. 
We love sweet stuff, but we don't uh, really love like ice cream, ice cream, but more to like shave ice. I said, why don't we bring our Indonesia dessert to our menu? And just like that, Creamberry started offering shaved ice. So we have the secret ingredients, which is the sauce, the red one, that make it very good with the condensed milk, with everything fruit on top for the shaved ice, and then it's a good combination. Danny's focus was on the full menu, adding unique treats from around the world to Creamberry, desserts like Thai rolled ice cream and Filipino halo halo. Recognizing the power of social media, Rosalina began posting photos and videos of their decadent creations to Instagram, and then later to TikTok. It's a practice that keeps modern ice cream parlors relevant, according to food historian Sarah Lohman. I think social media is important because, I mean, there's, there's people out there who are following ice cream places that maybe, maybe they'll go to, maybe they'll never go to, but it's like the visual appeal. Most people who buy cookbooks don't actually cook the recipes. It's like they flip through the pages to go on a journey. I think like social media and like ice cream social media lets us do that as well. One of their most eye-catching treats, the legendary cotton candy burrito, a social media and IRL favorite. Ooh, another one, maybe, ooh, look at this, the giant burrito. Oh, okay, the birthday burrito. Yeah, the birthday burrito. I think that should be perfect for today. Hashtag genius. The cotton candy burrito proves that something savory can be the sweetest inspiration. I was having Mexican dinner one night and uh, of course eating burritos and tacos. That's where it gave me the idea, hey, why don't I try to experiment this into a dessert? And long behold, it actually worked. Rosalina was immediately impressed. I was like, man, that's a good idea. Creamberry was one of the first shops in the U.S. to offer the viral treat, but it took a few tries to perfect. As everybody knows, cotton candy is very fragile, and any type of a moisture or it will just ruin the cotton candy. The first step in the process isn't posted on social media. Spinning the cotton candy is one of our trade secrets for our cotton candy burrito. So we, we usually spin it in the back in the kitchen. The couple's young sons also deserve a shout out for their love of cotton candy and its impact on their business. Our kids love cotton candy, so that's why that's the first time that we bring the cotton candy to our shop. So what's more important, how their desserts look or how they taste? Both. Both. <laughs> if customers come in and they're visually attracted to it and they try it and it doesn't taste good, they're not going to come back yeah. and, and get the same dessert. So we eat with our eyes, right? So there's always been effort and consideration to the appearance of food, but the more photographs we can take and the wider they get spread, like with the spread of Instagram and social media, I think there's been even more of a sort of focus on how our food looks on camera. And ice cream is sort of the perfect medium for that. Like you can have a really wild color. You can have this like a really elaborate sundae, or you can have something that's just like really bold and beautiful. And luckily, because it's ice cream, it all still tastes good while looking good at the same time. Other Insta and TikTok worthy finds include their made to order ice cream tacos and wild milkshakes. For Rosalina, the more social interaction, the better. We really love to see the comments, how many likes we got, and then, you know, like a lot of people repost it too. And those comments, good and bad, help the duo refine their creations. Sometimes people say, oh, don't put too much sprinkled candy or whatever it is. And then sometimes we take it like, oh yeah, maybe not too much, Just maybe only a little bit. Yeah, it's very helpful for us yes. as well because then at least we can adjust what, what is necessary and to accommodate the customers. The virtual shares are sweet, but it's even sweeter when followers from around the world get to try Creamberry. We can never get enough of seeing all the smiles when the customers get their orders. Just the, the facial expression that they give us. In an era when we're bombarded with options, the simple joy of heading out for ice cream has withstood the test of time. I think that ice cream shops, spaces, parlors, ice creameries have survived because they've always fulfilled that community space and that family space. It's something that everybody can come together around. And families behind the counter will keep scooping up sweet memories for years to come. Hey guys, 
welcome to The Boost. It's your daily dose of positivity and hopefully a boost of happiness. All right, let's get us started. Donna Farrison explores the science of happiness and some simple tips to maximize it in your daily life. The way we spend our time and how we approach our time has a significant influence on how happy we are. In her new book, Happier Hour, author Cassie Holmes offers up ways to make each hour in your day feel more fulfilling. The thing we can control is how we spend our time. Cassie gave me some tips and exercises from the book to help bring my attention to the joy right in front of me. The first exercise was to do a random act of kindness. I just met Ken at the airport. I bought him a coffee. He was in line behind me. Cheers. Cheers. Kindness, pass it around. I have to tell you, this changed me. And then I sat down for my four hour flight, initially had my earbuds in, but then for three out of the four hours, I ended up talking and having a conversation with my seatmate and we became friends. And the sense of connection that comes from even an interaction with a stranger, mm -hmm. the sort of sense of belonging. Yes, it's with close others, but it's also the extent to which we feel connected to our communities and humanity. Next up, Cassie suggested I experience awe. I spent some time in Wyoming and I was horseback riding, which I love doing. Come on, monk. These sights are truly spectacular. But I was also so awe-inspired by the mountains, the view, the fresh air, the stargazing. When you go into nature, and you are inspired and filled with awe. What that does, it expands your perspective and expands your sense of time that you then feel less limited. You're not concerned about your schedule. But I actually felt like time was sitting still for a little bit in the best way. One tip Cassie gave me was to make my most joyful activities, like spending time with my parents, no phone zones. I love having morning coffee with my mom. I love going on walks with my dad. And I'm always snapping pictures, documenting, trying to make these memories. What you helped me realize was making the memories is also through just being present, not having to capture it or document. These are your most joyful activities and carving those out, making them no phone zones. It's really important because it not only affects your enjoyment, but the person that you're with, your mom and your dad, know that you're fully present. My biggest takeaway is I've identified the activities that boost my mood when I'm feeling down. And if we can control our own happiness, then that is one step towards improving it. Okay, I loved this. There are yeah. so many good yeah. exercises in this book. One that I just want everyone to know is the bundling strategy. Uh -huh. So basically, when you're doing something, a boring chore, something that yeah. seems time, uh -huh. time consuming, bundle a happy, joyful activity within it. I know you do this when you're cleaning, yeah, you blast like, music, music, or like if you're missing doing an activity, uh -huh you know, put on a podcast yeah. that talks mm -hmm. about that activity. Mm -hmm. Whatever it is, maybe mm -hmm. call a friend, that social connection. It's figure so out true. Figure out what brings you joy and then incorporate that. By the way, I love that. And I, I know, think we I all do. talk about a random act of kindness, but yeah. when did you last do one? Totally. Like, we say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Did but she say do one a day? One a she day. didn't say, she didn't put like a time limit on it, which I yeah. like too, because the whole part of why I loved th these exercises in this book was that it didn't feel like, a chore or a task. Yeah, it really must. felt like a way to yeah. implement yes. it kind Day. of authentically oh, into yeah. your life. Whenever it felt when right. When you feel yeah. like it. Thank you, Donna. All right, talk about acts of kindness. One teacher is changing lives by giving away one million books. Jenna Bush Hager caught up with the self-titled book lady. You kind of have two names, right? My name is Jennifer, or Miss Jennifer as well as the book lady. Why the book lady? Because I've given away 91,900 books in the last four, almost five years. Jennifer Williams is not your average elementary school teacher. For more than 30 years, her passion for reading and writing can be seen throughout her classrooms and community, even on display within letters her class wrote to my grandfather as he was leaving the White House in 1993. So some of these are hilarious. 
Dear Mr. Bush, we saw a picture of the White House. It is big. Do you have a cleaning lady? But it's her fierce determination to get one million books to students, to adults, to any reader that has endeared her to so many. How come you have such a lofty goal? I know personally the value of reading, the ability to read, um, the magic of stories. I wanted to make sure that my little town <laughs> as books. Jennifer's love for literature began early. Her mom was a school librarian and read to her kids every single day until they went to college. When Jennifer became a teacher and started working with children, she recognized immediately what a difference reading makes. There's no denying as a teacher, I can spend five minutes with a kid I've never met before. And when you talk to them, the way they carry themselves, the way they answer questions, there's a very different countenance between a child who has ready access to books or just you know someone to share stories with them versus someone who doesn't. When tutoring students, they begged to keep the books she'd read to them. Recognizing their need, she started giving books to every child, every time. To this day, the mission Miss Jennifer lives by, no one who wants a book leaves without one from novels left by neighbors to spending thousands of our own money for more stories. Danville's Book Lady makes sure little free libraries never go empty, school bookshelves are filled, and even keeps books in her car in case she meets a new friend. Jennifer also started the Second Chance Book Club at the Danville City Jail for women. Two years in, the club is on its 59th book. And why did you title it the Second Chance Book Club? I think by the time you end up in jail, most people have already told you what you've done wrong. I wanted them to always feel like there was always a second chance. Here's to 30,000 more. Jennifer has chronicled her journey to one million books in a Facebook group she calls Joy of Reading. And by the looks of it, the book lady has no plans of slowing down anytime soon. You have calculated how long it'll take you to donate one million books. At my current rate, I will be 92. <laughs> but you're not going to stop. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not going to stop as long as I can do it. Wow. wow. Amazing. That's amazing. She? Okay, guys, joining us live from her school in Chatham, Virginia, can we say good oh. morning to Mrs. Jennifer Williams? Good morning. Oh, and a couple okay, hundred buddy. of the students and teachers at Chatham good Elementary. Oh, Mrs. Cool. Williams, kids, good morning. Awesome. Mrs. Williams, I, you know, you were talking about your mom and how she inspired you. Mm -hmm. She passed away. Um, but what do you think she would be thinking in this moment, looking at you and all this success? I really, really hope that she would be proud. I hope that she would know that what she started in me keeps going through me to other people. Wow. Well, I love you. We yeah. had such a bond, and you know Thank what? You. We want to celebrate you. We can't just share your story without helping in some way, so we have a couple surprises. Let's yeah. do it. Okay. So we know that you love to stock okay. those little free libraries. Am I right, Mrs. Williams? Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, guess what? When we told this, your story to the nonprofit organization, they thought you should have your own little free library. Kids, can you reveal the library? Hello? What? There it is. Yay! Wow. Yay! Mrs. Williams, the plaque reads read Jennifer the plaque. Williams Library, a.k.a. the book lady. <laughs> what do you think? Thank you. Sweet. You like it? I love it. I oh. love it. Oh. Awesome. Yes, okay, well, great. Mrs. Williams, awesome. that's not it, okay? Penguin Random House heard about your story, and they also want to contribute to your goal. So Principal Wanda Carter is there to help us with the next part. Take it away, Dr. Carter. Oh, all right, kids. We're going to okay. count back. more to Little Free Library to be distributed nationwide. So now your goal to help folks across the country is complete. That's over $130,000 worth of books. And by the way, wow. 
I don't know if you can do that. You can do the math. You're incredible. You do math fast. Guess what? That makes your milestone of 100,000 books donated. Yeah. <laughs> Coming up, a company that is giving away its products, all for a very good cause. Stay with us. NBC News, streaming free now. NBC News, streaming free now. We begin tonight with breaking news just coming in. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. You get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love you. I love you too. <laughs> We begin tonight with breaking news just coming in. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. It's the best time of the morning. Time for the pop start, baby. Oh, I'm feeling the vibe today on the show. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Welcome back. A Minnesota mill has been in the blanket business since 1865, and their latest initiative helps keep their community cozy. Joe Fryer has that story. At Fairbow Mill, a blanket is so much more than a billowing scrap of fabric. Making one is a 22-step process. What is this? That is wool. Wool. Supervisor Rafael Medina showed us how clouds of wool are dyed and dried in industrial-sized machines. So this is a little bigger than the dryers in our houses, right? Definitely. Gradually, they're shaped into strands of strong yarn that are woven into cuddly... I make them fluffy? ...colorful coverings. What do you think when you see the final product coming together? I think it's like a painting. It looks like a painting being made. An elaborate operation that recently added a 23rd step. You see, many of the blankets are now delivered to shelters. Oh, I like the colors. That are helping young people who are experiencing homelessness. For us to be able to just provide even some comfort, it really says a lot about the mill, you know, itself. It gives you even more pride. Definitely, it definitely does. Hi guys, if anyone wants a blanket, you can come over and grab one. Super warm, fun colors. Fairbow Mill calls it spread the warmth. For every single blanket the company sells, one is donated. Thank you, thank you. An entirely new business model that was just launched in September. Every night I get to tuck both of my two boys into bed to put them under a warm blanket and to know that four million kids in this country tonight will not have that same experience. It's enough to break your heart. And as a company that makes blankets, we felt like we were in a unique position to do something about that. Several donated blankets recently made their way to Youth Link in Minneapolis, which helps young people find long-term housing. Come on, let's get warm. The gifts were warmly received. This is gonna be my new favorite best friend. I'm telling you right now. I'm so grateful, thank y'all for real. But the blankets provide more than warmth. There's greater meaning. It means that they deserve something. They deserve something new, they deserve something meaningful, and they deserve to be loved and cared for. Ferris Bate has never needed love and care more. The 23-year-old did not have a place to stay when he moved from Georgia. Before you found this place here, did you have a place to stay? No, I don't have no place to stay. So where were you, where were you sleeping? Really, I was sleeping in the car. YouthLink helped him find medical care and a place to live. Though a blanket may seem small, Ferris is grateful. Our blanket, oh yeah, they, this was really helpful. The blanket, this is the only thing that we need because it's getting cold. The blanket's something you'll use? Oh yeah, the blanket has really been helpful. You can see my blanket, it's really nice, you know. For Fairbow Mill, this 23rd step is not a temporary campaign. It's a permanent mission, now woven 
into the company's fabric. So when we provide this blanket, is it going to solve homelessness? No. But is it going to provide comfort and warmth to a kid in need? The answer is yes. And we've been doing that for 157 years. We hope to be doing that for another 157 years from here on out. Oh, that one gave us all the warm fuzzies. All right, next. We want to bring you to a special place, a California ranch that is inspiring inner city kids. And it all started with a viral moment during one of our nation's most volatile times. Black Lives Matter protests were erupting daily during the spring of 2020. And it seems that people are more enraged by the destruction that happens than the loss of a life. So I said to myself, I'm gonna give them something to look at. That's when cameras captured 25-year-old Brianna Noble as she rode into a protest. You have to remember this image. She nobly rode atop her horse to downtown Oakland. And that image went viral. So I've tried since then to drive all of that attention to the work that we do here in our communities. As a child, Brianna loved horses and growing up as a competitive show jumper, she says there were many unspoken hurdles for equestrians of color. I remember being a little kid and wondering why, you know, I couldn't fit my helmet on and I didn't have the same hair as people and all of those things. And, you know, I'll never forget going to, to horse camp and, you know, meeting people that had actually never even seen a black person. Riding and caring for horses is also a costly barrier for kids in disadvantaged communities. Brianna worked as a vet tech to keep up with her expenses. It definitely made me want to create a space that was more welcoming, where horses are what's paid attention to and not so much where you're from, how much money you make, or your skin color. We created this space here where we are not the minority. Our whole barn is filled with, you know, every sort of color there is. So I'm really proud and excited to be able to change that scene. Initially, Urban Cowgirl Ranch started as an eight-week riding program. That became unsustainable very, very quickly. We had a wait list of over a thousand people. And many of the kids eager to visit were from the inner city, where just 15 miles are a world away from here. Okay, come on in. We have kids and adults out here that have never seen a chicken in their lives and never seen a horse in their lives outside of TV. Let's see about your helmet, girlfriend. The ranch quickly grew into a nonprofit foundation with several Oakland area community groups using the property and its animals. As a living classroom, in addition to abundant beginnings, the ranch's permanent preschool. Okay, ready, let's go. Erica Lila is a mom of three-year-old Zoe. It's a baby chicken. They're outside every single day um, and just really being able to connect with the land, being able to connect with themselves, and really appreciating the beauty of California. And for Brianna, the best teaching still comes straight from a horse's mouth. Horses are amazing. They're very honest creatures. They tell you a lot. Most people just can't hear them. Awesome. Yeah, good job. Whoa, 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 whoa. We've got a kid down. You are not a real cowboy or cowgirl until you have fallen off of a horse. I love working with kids. High five. I love working with community and I love facilitating interactions between humans and animals. That's what I'm here and I'm meant to do. To help offset the enormous cost of feeding all 20 horses and the many farm animals, the ranch now sustainably makes its own hydroponic feed, which churns out 700 pounds a day from this tiny shed. Brianna hopes that even a class, a day, or a week spent here will leave a child riding higher than they ever could have hoped. It sparks an interest in the environment. It sparks an interest in the outdoors. So a big part of what we want to do here is showing them that there's a world outside of here. There's a world outside the city. There's jobs. It's like a dream. Your beloved grandmother in the kitchen preparing family favorites. Where were you born? In Italia. Is that where you learned how to cook? Yeah. yeah. My nonna, my mother. But Nona Maria cooks for customers, not your cousins, at a restaurant in Staten Island. Aren't you supposed to be retired? Uh, I, I like to work. I like to do. <laughs> you like to work? I like to come every day. Grandma's in the Kitchen is the specialty of the house at Enoteca Maria. It's, it's magic. Owner and proprietor, Joe Scaravella. 
I think the whole attraction with grandmothers, uh, it's when you're growing up, it's, that's like your safe space. Over more than a decade, Scaravella has assembled a mini UN of abuelas, boobies, and nanas. Home cooking cuisines from Asia to the Middle East. Every night, a split menu, Italian and food from someplace else. Something sort of magic happens every evening here. We're always anticipating what the different nonas bring. I think I know plenty of grandmothers that aren't that good at cooking, but, <laughs> but I've never seen one here. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. You want to try this? Especially when Nona Maria is holding forth. You're a genius. Oh, yeah? Thank yeah. you. When I, I come inside, my face is smile. Ah, I feel so good. Coming up next, the powerful bond between humans and their animals. How many of you were up there? At least like 11. How real is this going back to the moon? <laughs> Thank you, Lester. Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. What do people need most right now? Did the state and or law enforcement drop the ball? Migrant families now stranded in Mexico. What's the World Cup experience been like? It's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. You get one beautiful so life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love ya. <laughs> How many of you were up there? At least like 11. How real is this going back to the moon? Thank you, Aunt Lester. You get one beautiful so life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love ya. Love you too. It's the best time of the morning. Time for the pop star thing. I'm feeling the vibe today on the show. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Welcome back to The Boost. The bond between humans and animals is remarkable. And that's certainly true for one animal lover who adopted a rescue horse. And little did they know, they would be starting a life-changing journey together. Coffee and carrots and a horse at my counter in my kitchen. It's probably the most zen therapy that I have found. Calm comes over me. I feel it's my happy place. Meet Amerigo, a 1,600-pound Percheron quarter horse mix who her owner, Charles Robbins Linford, calls his porch unicorn. Their story starts here, at their home in a beautiful forest in Washington State. Amerigo was a rescue horse, a Christmas gift from Charles's husband, Mark, five years ago. I drove up, I met her, and I wrote her one time and said, she's coming home. A little over a month later, Charles rode Amerigo for the last time. I did all the wrong things as a human being. She continued to tell me that she didn't want to be ridden, and she kept moving away from the mounting block uh, over and over and over again. Um, I forced the issue and finally got on her back, and she did a few bucks, and I ended up underneath her. And then she came down on my leg with her back hoof, crushing my leg. It was such a bad um, compound fracture. I was wearing rubber boots, and it brought my bones out through the side of my boot and stuck them in the ground. So when rescue got here, they actually had to pull everything out of the mud. The leg injury causing multiple infections, needing countless rounds of antibiotics, six surgeries, and 52 days in the hospital. 
To cope, Charles shared his journey on Facebook. I'm really scared. I have no doubt this is what's necessary and that it's gonna have to happen. 10 months after the accident, doctors said his leg had to go. On November 29th, 2018, Charles awoke from his seventh surgery as an amputee. Kind of in recovery and doing really well. Especially since I have this most amazing human next to me. Back at home, he had to face Amerigo and the scene of the accident every day. Even though I didn't blame her, I now had fear of her, and I never had fear of her. Amerigo reaching out to him first. She started standing by my window. She would just face in and just watch and look to the point where we started opening the window and she would stick her head inside. Then they would sit quietly together with morning coffee. I don't know what it is about her, but she's got a spirit that pulls you in really quick. To watch her move or to see her across the yard, there's just a glow about her. And before he knew it, Amerigo decided to come into the house. Well, hello. I was in the laundry room one day, folding laundry, and I hear the door swing open and hit the wall. With time, Charles and Amerigo put tragedy behind them, continuing to heal together, forming a magical bond. The accident was horrible and it took a while to get over, but what came from it and what it is now is so special. It's made me a better person. It's changed my life completely. I feel like I'm nicer. I feel like I have empathy for people. Charles says he rescued Amerigo to give her a better life. But what she gave him in return, despite that accident, is a love that will last a lifetime. I wanted to be able to take care of her. I mean, that was a huge part of my recovery too, is I had a responsibility to her. She wasn't gonna get rescued anymore. She's home. Oh, what an incredible relationship to witness. Coming up next, a special boost you do not want. You get one beautiful life to live. What are you gonna do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world to me. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm gonna go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the I way. love riding the way. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Oh, yeah, I love you too. <laughs> no stress, no mess, just yum. That's it. Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. NBC News, streaming free now. What do people need most right now? Did the state and or law enforcement drop the ball? Migrant families now stranded in Mexico. What's the World Cup experience been like? It's your news playlist. Top story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. No stress, no mess, just yum. That's it. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. It's the best time of the morning. Time for our pop star, baby. Oh, I'm feeling the vibe today on the show. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Welcome back. It's a time for a look at today's morning boost. The Detroit Red Wings have a new star. It's not any of the players on the ice. It's a little four-year-old kid, a little boy named George, who did an amazing job of getting the crowd all revved up at a recent game. Take a look. the jumbotron between George and whoever, the visiting uh, Vancouver Canuck fans, went on for another minute. Turns out it was George's first game, oh first Red God. Wings oh. game, and he's so popular with the fans, his mom said at least 100 people asked to take a picture with him. That's hilarious. She says that night 
Boo. <laughs> oh my god. Well, you, they'll never forget. Uh, <laughs> look at him, always so cute. Great. Always love to end the show on that note. And we're going to put another smile on your face when we see you back here tomorrow for the boost on Today All Day. Hello, and thanks for joining us for Consumer Confidential. I'm Vicki Wynn. Winter is officially here, and February, on average, is the snowiest month. For a lot of cities, this is the second coldest month of the year. For the next 25 minutes, we have your winter survival guide. If you've ever had to walk or drive in snow, you know winter presents unique challenges. Snow and ice can make getting around tricky and downright dangerous. So do you know how to maneuver in these slippery conditions? We head back to driver's ed for some potentially life-saving lessons. Winter sports can be fun, and with the right equipment and precautions, you can avoid a trip to the emergency room. And don't spend a fortune cranking up the heat. A look at the hacks and tips to keep costs down while staying warm. Plus, despite the cold temps, you can still find hot deals. But first, some tools and appliances you should have around the house for the winter months. Freezing temperatures, snow and ice, all making for dangerous conditions during the winter. What are the most common injuries when winter comes around? And I'm in an emergency room in Colorado where we typically see a lot of winter injuries. And probably the biggest one are people slipping and falling on ice. In 2019 alone, fall-related injuries sent more than 8 million Americans to the emergency room. They'll hurt their backs, they'll hurt their heads, they'll hurt their shoulders. To avoid slipping and falling, make sure you have shoes with traction. If you have to brave the snow and ice, walk like a penguin. Slightly point your feet out and bend your knees, extend your arms out to your sides for balance, and take short steps or shuffle. Every year, snow shoveling causes thousands of injuries and about 100 deaths, most caused by heart attacks. Something as simple as shoveling snow can actually be fairly dangerous. It's a very, very strenuous workout. So even though they're feeling the symptoms, they're feeling chest pain, they're feeling shortness of breath, they have this goal of a driveway they want to clear so they keep moving forward. Symptoms of a heart attack can include chest discomfort, shortness of breath, even nausea. Besides taking frequent breaks, push the snow instead of lifting it. If you must lift, only partially fill the shovel so it's lighter. And remember to use your legs, not your back. Also, consider using an ergonomic shovel like this one to avoid back injuries. Snowblowers can save you time and energy when clearing snow, but they can also cost you a trip to the hospital. On average, nearly 6,000 injuries result from snowblowers each year. According to the Consumer Product Safety Commission, most snowblower injuries happen when someone tries to clear snow from the discharge chute. First, stop the engine. Use a long stick, not your hands, to unclog the machine. Add fuel when the engine is cold and do it in a well-ventilated area outdoors. Remember, never run your snowblower in a shed or a garage because of carbon monoxide dangers. Known as the silent killer, every year carbon monoxide poisoning kills hundreds and sickens thousands more. A majority of the deaths occurring between November and February, when many use portable generators for warmth. Your home can contain other potential sources for carbon monoxide, including a fireplace if it's not well ventilated and working properly. That's why you want to make sure you have enough of these carbon monoxide detectors installed throughout your house. If you plan to use a space heater in your home, don't get burned. As the name suggests, give the heater some space. Keep it at least three feet away from anything flammable like this dog bed. And always plug it directly into the wall, never a power strip. And if you do have to brave the elements, make sure you dress in layers and don't forget about your four-legged family members, especially if your dog has a short coat like Moose here, get him a sweater or a parka and don't forget the booties. It's a fetching and functional look. Booties protect your dog's paws from the cold, salt and other irritants. But try telling that to Moose. Good boy, it takes a little getting used to, huh? He kept the coat on, booties not so much. All right, joining us now with more on staying safe and healthy in this frigid weather, NBC News senior medical correspondent, Dr. John Torres, a favorite of our show. Hey, Dr. Torres, so good to see you. You're an ER doc in Colorado. You're no stranger to snowy weather. First, talk to us about what's the best way for us to dress in layers to stay, home, stay warm without overheating. 
Yeah, this is important because you want to make sure you stay warm, but if you get too warm, you can work with that as well. So you want to dress in three layers, basically. Number one, the base layer underneath. You want something that's synthetic. It's a synthetic material that can wick away the moisture, and that way it doesn't build up and start freezing your body. The middle layer should provide some insulation. We're talking sweaters, sweatshirt, fleece. All those work really well for this type of thing. And then the outdoor layer is the one you want to block the wind and the rain. Now, all of these layers should be loose. That'll help trap in warm air and they should be layers that you can take off and put back on depending on your body temperature because you don't want to sweat in the middle of the winter. But also, don't forget, socks, gloves, and hat, extremely important, Vicki. Yeah, walking my kids to school here in the Northeast, I know that when any part of your skin is exposed <laughs> to the cold, it can be so painful. How do you know when it's serious, like if you have frostbite? So one of the things you have to remember about frostbite is the areas that don't have much circulation are the ones that are going to be affected the most. And we have a little rhyme. It's fingers, nose, ears, and toes. Those are the ones that are going to get frostbitten first. So if you start getting pain, especially if it starts intensifying and you start getting that tingling pain, it starts getting worse. And especially if it starts going away, those are signs that you need to seek immediate medical attention. Now, if they're just tingling a little bit, you get back inside, you can put them in warm and not hot water. Think of the same water you give a baby a bath in and that can bring the feeling back but if that feeling gets super intense or does or suddenly goes away you need to be checked especially if you notice any blistering vicky oh fingers ears nose and toes got it all right what about hypothermia what are the warning signs and symptoms for that so hypothermia is when your body core temperature starts dropping and your body does what it can to build up the heat. So it's going to start shivering and that shivering is going to be light. We've all experienced that, but then it can start becoming uncontrollable. If that happens, you need to get inside. If you can't get inside, you need to wrap yourself with as many layers as possible, particularly get out of the wind. And if you're with somebody and they start getting confused, that's a medical emergency. You want to make sure they get treated as soon as possible. And last quick question, Dr. John, things happen we don't expect, so what should we do to prepare for a winter weather emergency when we're out there? So one of the things you want to prepare for is make sure you have a go bag, and that go bag has the things in it you need that you need to survive over the next couple of days. You know, things like important documents, extra set of house keys, some cash in case you need cash, mm -hmm. things you can eat and drink, water, non-perishable foods, have a flashlight, have a hand-cranked radio can definitely help. Take your medications, toiletries. If you have a cell phone, make sure you take your charger as well. And then a first aid kit, some extra blankets, warm clothing, hand warmers, those things that can help you survive for a couple of days because you never know when that's going to happen. And I know that you think about this often, but if you have pets, they're going to need a go bag too, Vicki. All right, two go bags. That was great advice. Always good to see you. Thank you, Dr. Torres. <laughs> you bet. Our winter survival guide continues. We'll show you how to stay warm without breaking the bank. Plus, we're heading to driving school for a look at how to safely maneuver on slick, icy, and snowy roads. Also, we'll have your safety guide to winter fun. From sledding to skiing, Consumer Confidential is coming right back. This is what it looks and feels like. The, latest the bigger piece of the puzzle. We begin tonight with breaking news. How much water ultimately will be forced inland? Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. You get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love you. Yeah. Love you too. <laughs> What do people need most right now? Did the state and or law enforcement drop the ball? Migrant families now stranded in Mexico. What's the World Cup experience been like? It's your news playlist. Top story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. It's the best time of the morning. Time for the pop star, baby. I'm feeling the vibe today on the show. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. For Dateline Premium, subscribe now on Apple Podcasts. Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. Winter weather can cause dangerous driving conditions from slick and icy roads to ending up stuck in a ditch or a snowbank. That happened to me once. But a little preparation and know-how can help you literally steer your way out of a snowy mess. 
It's winter, and that can mean situations like this. Cars slipping and sliding all over the road and drivers stranded. In January, thousands of motorists spent 24 hours stuck on a stretch of I-95 in Virginia. Of course, the safest option is to stay off the roads when it's snowy and icy, but sometimes that's not possible. So I'm heading back to driver's ed to get a refresher on how to drive in the winter. Aliyah Borelli owns the AP Driving School in New Jersey and has 10 years of experience as a licensed instructor. Aliyah, what's the first thing we need to know before we hit the road in the winter? So the first thing you want to do is know what kind of conditions you're driving into and winterize your car for those conditions. That means clear off the snow and check to ensure your tires are roadworthy. Use the penny trick. If you can see the top of Lincoln's head, that means your tread is worn and you may need new tires. And there are a few must-have items to keep in your car. You want to definitely have some kind of blanket in a pack that can stay dry. Okay. We also have some snacks and some water. Mm -hmm. A remote jump start that is a pack that can jump start your car if you need to jump and you don't need to have another car around. She also recommends a head-mounted flashlight. And this one I like because you can strap it onto your head in case you need to find maybe if you drop your keys or if you need to change a tire. And she says always keep your tank at least half full in case you get stranded and need heat. With our winter supplies ready, it's time to get a driving lesson. When you are driving in icy conditions, what should you keep in mind? So the first thing you want to do is you want to reduce your speed. She says the speed limit is only for optimal conditions. In the winter, slow down and give yourself 150 feet to come to a full stop. You're increasing your reaction time and you're increasing the car's reaction time to different terrain. Mm -hmm. Borelli says the old rule of pumping your brakes no longer applies. Most cars today have anti-lock brake systems. The computer chip in the car is pumping your brakes for you. Let's say I hit an icy patch. What should I do? Should I hit the brakes? So you don't want to hit the brakes. You don't want to change that momentum that that car has already too quickly. You want to come off the accelerator and you want to regain control of the car. Let's say the back of my car starts to skid to the left. What do I do? What you want to do is first remain calm and come off of your accelerator. Then you want to adjust your steering wheel very gently to the left. You're okay. turning your steering wheel in the direction that the back of the car is skidding. She says by doing that, you're preventing the car from going into a spin. What if you do slide off the road and get stuck? Let's say we've run into a snowbank. What's the first thing we need to think about? So the first thing you want to do is make sure that you are visible. If you have some flares, now's the time to use them. Okay, make sure you read the instructions for how to light the flare and place the first one about eight paces away from your car. And the second one about 40 paces away. This is to give other cars enough distance to see you and react. No flares? Borelli says don't use hazard lights, which blink. Instead, use your parking lights. Here's the symbol. They'll keep your lights solid, which indicates to drivers you've come to a stop. It sounds strange, but keeping kitty litter in the car could save you. A little kitty litter right behind your tires might give you that extra traction that you need to get unstuck from your spot. You can also use your car's floor mat. Some easy tips and tools to help you out of an icy jam. Another tip, if it is foggy, avoid turning on your brights. The light will actually bounce off the fog and make it harder to see. Instead, slow down to increase your reaction time. Use your fog lights instead. Those beams actually point down and make it easier to see the road. As for tire chains or studded snow tires, experts say use those in mountainous or very snowy areas, but in most cases, they're not necessary. Some states even ban them, except under extreme conditions, because they can damage the roads. All right, well, don't let a day of fun end with a trip to the emergency room. Your safety checklist for winter sports from skiing to ice skating to sledding. How to tell if you're pushing your body too hard. And later, money matters. The deals you can discover during the winter months. Consumer Confidential returns after this short break. How many of you were up there? At least like 11. How real is this going back to the moon? <laughs> How you doing, Lester? No stress, no mess, just yum. That's it. NBC News, streaming free now. What do people need most right now? Did the state and or law enforcement drop the ball? 
migrant families now stranded in Mexico. What's the World Cup experience been like? It's your news playlist. Top story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. NBC News. Streaming free now. No stress, no mess, just yum. That's it. I love mornings. They're full of possibility. And how you start your day sets the tone for the whole day. We feel like we're right there with you. Because every day we start our morning so you can take on yours. You get one beautiful life to live. What are you going to do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm going to go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the I way. love riding. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Uh, yeah, I love you too. <laughs> The winter months can mean a flurry of seasonal activities from hitting the slopes to grabbing the sleds, even lacing up your ice skates. While it's great to get your heart pumping and take advantage of the cold weather fun, make sure you brush up on the basics to avoid a trip to the emergency room. From Olympic athletes to everyday thrill seekers, winter sports take many to new heights, but not without the risk of serious injury. They're so enthralled by the sport that they forget about the injury risk. Dr. Wimi Diogi is an orthopedic surgeon who serves as director of sports medicine at MedStar Washington Hospital Center in Washington, D.C. Is this the busiest time of year for a doctor like yourself? For ski-related, uh, snowboard-related injuries, absolutely. In 2020, skiing resulted in more than 23,000 visits to the ER. Snowboarding, another 19,000. That's why safety experts say when it comes to taking the right precautions, there are just some things you just shouldn't let slide, like making sure you have the proper gear. What are some of the most common injuries? There's a large number of concussions, lacerations, fractures. It's really important to wear a helmet when you're, you're performing these sports. Before hitting the slopes, Dr. Duogi says, be honest about your skill level. Don't attempt a double black diamond if you've only experienced a bunny hill. And for those over age 40, he suggests scheduling a checkup with your doctor. You're gonna be doing activities that are gonna test your aerobic and anaerobic fitness. You need to get an expert's consultation to make sure that you're healthy before you jump out there. As ski and snowboard injuries reach their peak, keeping doctors busy, this time of year also has ski shops like this one in high demand. One of the keys to staying safe on the slopes, selecting the right equipment. The first hill to climb, dressing the part. Start by wearing several light and loose layers, followed by an outer layer that's wind and water resistant, like these snow bibs. Focus on fit. Lisa Ski NYC store manager Charlie Marone says find an adjustable helmet. Look for the knobs in the back. A lot of ski helmets, the newer ones have knobs that you can tighten it. Like a nice yeah. snug fit. Right. What's next? Next you want goggles. You want to make sure they fit your face right. You want to cover the sides as well. Let's get to the skis now. What do we need to know? You want to get the right size. Typically for beginners, we want to be under the chin because the shorter ski is easier to ski with. And then you want to look at the width here. Wider ski, easier to navigate as well. How about the boots? You want to get the right size, it's very important. You want to be a snug fit, you want to hug your foot. Because boots mold to your feet, Marone recommends buying new rather than used. When you do used boot, you don't know what foot's been in it, it wouldn't fit your foot correctly. Once you have your boots properly fitted, make sure an expert has set your bindings according to your height, weight, and ability so that the skis will release and prevent injury if you have a bad fall. And because so many winter activities combine high speed and slick surfaces, you can't skate around the risk of falling. But you can learn a safer way to take a tumble. If you lose your balance while ice skating, try to land on your behind or you'll have the best cushioning. 
And avoid putting your hands on the ice, especially at a crowded rink where another skater's blade could cut you. Sledding, a popular winter pastime for children, also sends thousands to the ER each year. Do you recommend wearing a helmet when kids are tubing or sledding? You can never go wrong wearing a helmet. For added protection, kids should also avoid sledding headfirst and stick to hills free of obstacles with plenty of room at the bottom. Avoid those that end in a street or a body of water. A guide to help you and your family enjoy the ride this winter. Looks fun, but before you take part in any winter sports, warm up cold muscles with light exercise or stretching, stay hydrated, and avoid overexerting yourself. Dr. Duogi says skiers tend to suffer knee injuries, while snowboarders often injure their internal organs like their kidneys, liver, and spleen. So take it easy and listen to your body. The doctor told us he can't even count the number of patients who got hurt on that one last run. All right, still to come, money matters from the best deals available during the winter months to cutting your home heating costs. Much more when Consumer Confidential returns. How many of you were up there? At least like 11. How real is this going back to the moon? How you doing, Lester? It's the best time of the morning. Time for the pop baby. I'm feeling the vibe today on the show. No stress, no mess, just yum. That's it. You get one beautiful so life to live. What are you gonna do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world. Oh. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm gonna go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the I way. Love the ride. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Oh, yeah. I love you, too. <laughs> you might notice an increase in your home heating bill. The U.S. government has said the cost of heating your home could rise as much as 54% because of inflation. But there are some easy ways you can save money while still staying warm. Here with us is Amy Matthews. She's a general contractor and home improvement expert. Hey, Amy, what are some ways that we can cut down on our winter heating bills this season while still staying safe and cozy? Yes, absolutely. Well, my goal for people is for number one, them to understand their house better. And number two, to increase their comfort while decreasing their cost. And there's a lot of really easy ways that you can go about that without doing anything new or purchasing anything. And first of all, turn down the thermostat. I know it sounds really, really simple, but uh, the Department of Energy will say that they're going to assume you're going to bring your heating bill down by 1% uh, for each degree you turn the temperature down. Ooh. That ends up being a lot because if you turn your temperature down from seven to 10 degrees, either when you're sleeping or when you're away, that's an immediate savings on your energy bill by 10%, so that's awesome. Um, another thing that you wanna do is you not wanna heat rooms that you're not in. So let's okay. say uh, if it's a child's room during the day when they're not there or a playroom or an area that you're not using, close the vents to that space so you're not spending money on those kind of things. Um, there's a lot of other areas that we lose heat and that's gonna be through windows and doors mostly. So take a look around your house and check for leaks. See if, there, if you can feel any drafts by any windows or doors because there's easy fixes for those. Um, and then of course the ceiling fans are something that people think of using during the summer but during the winter if you reverse them and turn them on clockwise you're not getting a breeze you're actually pulling the air you're creating a, a convection so you're pulling the air up and then pushing it back down the sides of the room so that way you're taking that hot air that gets stuck at the top back down to where you feel it in the space which is great so there's a, there's, there's so, so many more I, yeah great tips those are all free easy to do you make a little air fryer out of your room with that ceiling fan amy thank you what Absolutely. about insulation how do we figure out if our homes are properly insulated well you want to take a look up in your attic for sure to get started because just like we put on a hat in the winter so we hold the heat in anywhere that we're losing air upstairs in our attic it, you're literally sending money through the roof so if you've got an attic take a peek up there see if your insulation needs to be uh, updated fixed if it's in uh, you know it gets it squishes over time um, and you want to be able to add insulation there so that you're not losing um, heat through the roof um, and then also check your 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 walls if you're in a really old home you may have shredded 
inserted a newspaper in your walls that is mm. your insulation. And there are ways to fix and update that. It's not a quick and easy and cheap fix, but it is possible. And if you're doing a renovation, it's a really great time to consider where you're pulling uh, walls down, where you're renovating, and if you can add extra insulation at that time, it's a good time to do it. Well, that's good to think about, and you can eyeball it in the attic at least. And then quickly, talk to us about Absolutely. the bottom line. If you do this heating audit of your house and then you implement some of these tips, how much do you think people can save? Well, you know, right off the bat, like I mentioned, turning down your thermostat is a big one. Getting a programmable mm -hmm. thermostat, that's going to save you a ton of money as well. If you add all these little different hacks in, I'm aiming for people to get about a 25% savings on wow. their heating bill. And it's totally doable. But you have to just walk through the house, possibly do an energy audit, invest in one of mm -hmm. those is a great way to understand your house better and know where you're having uh, the leakage. So then you can pinpoint it because every house is totally different. Mm -hmm. But if you can add up to 25% to by, you know, like cutting down on all these different things, um, you're going to see a big savings and that money goes right back in your pocket. Love it. Thank you. Very important and to be deliberate about it. Amy Matthews, thank you. Good to have you. Thanks so much. Up next, where to find the deals during the winter months. So look at what to buy and how to find those discounts. Consumer Confidential, we'll be right back. We begin tonight with breaking news just coming in. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. What do people need most right now? Did the state and or law enforcement drop the ball? Migrant families now stranded in Mexico. What's the World Cup experience been like? It's your news playlist. Top story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. It might be cold outside, but there are still plenty of hot deals to get your hands on during the winter season. Supply chain issues and inflation have continued to affect the prices of everything from household items to groceries. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, meats, poultry, fish and eggs up 12 and percent. Fruits and vegetables up 5 percent. Furniture and bedding jumped 13.8 percent. Women's dresses, jewelry, and watches costing you about 8% more. And if you've been to the store, you know it. Consumers having a much harder time finding deals in the marketplace. But luckily, we have shopping expert Trey Bodge with us today. She's going to break down everything you need to know about what to buy right now. Trey, so good to see you. Let's get right into it. After a really tough holiday season with shipping delays and price hikes, I think everyone was really ready for a clean slate in this new year. But it just feels like we can't catch a break. So what's your thought? How much longer are we going to see these high prices and supply chain issues. It's so hard to say, Vicki, just because we are still seeing these supply chain issues. Some of them are sorting out, but some of them aren't, especially anything with a chip in it. We are seeing delays mm. there, cars, electronics, things like that. I mean, the good news for consumers is that some of the merchandise is coming in and it's almost too much merchandise at this point. So we might find unexpected sales, which I always like to see. There's a degree of unpredictability. All right, well, this obviously hasn't been a standard year for those sales, but there are deals still out there. So what's your best advice for where shoppers can find those discounts and what should people be looking to buy now if they need these items? Sure. So winter apparel will be on clearance. So for instance, if your coat is old, and you need a new one, or if your cat, your hat isn't warm enough, those are good things to look for. You should find clearance level deals there. And then there are certain periods in the month that I really like for saving. So for instance, we're going close to Valentine's Day. If you're looking for jewelry, we often see deals on jewelry or anything Valentine's Day themed. It's also good to wait until right after Valentine's Day and you get clearance level deals there. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a Super Bowl coming up. The big game is a great time to invest in a new TV if you need that, or entertaining items like food, platters, glasses. And then we have President's Day. And you mentioned that big price increase on furniture and bedding. We should mm -hmm. see some deals mm -hmm. in that category. So that'll be exciting to see too. Oh, well, that's a great rundown for us. What are things that we want, might want to wait to buy right now? Sure. So I would wait on electronics because, again, we are seeing that chip shortage and they're not typically on sale in February anyway, aside from TVs. And so mm -hmm. I would wait if you can until June for that category. I would also wait on spring apparel. You may see some teaser deals, but it's not going to be anything substantial until later in the season. And then I would say toys, too, because they were just on sale in December. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to find good deals there. All right, kids, wait on the toys. When it comes to groceries, that's such a big part of all of our budgets, and it's not something that we can put off. Give us some simple strategies to use to stretch our money. 
right? So you may need to go back to menu planning if you've left it behind. Look at the circulars that are in your mailbox. Go to deal sites to see if there are deals. I am seeing a lot of deals, especially on delivery services for food. Mm -hmm. And so that's a good way to strategize and save maybe 15% off, 20% off. That's a good way to go with your menu planning. And then buy in bulk when it makes sense, only on those items that you are sure that you will go through, especially if you have a bigger family. Smart shopping expert, Trey Bodge. Always good to see you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Vicki. And that is our time for now. For all of us at NBC News, I'm Vicki Wynn. Be sure to join me for another edition of Consumer Confidential right here on Today All Day. In the meantime, stay warm and safe. You scream, I, okay, I'm gonna stop right there because I know you know how it goes. We are here at New York City's legendary Lexington candy shop. Happens to be my neighborhood luncheonette. And there was a time when soda fountains and diners like this were all over New York City and all over the country. Whether it's a cone, a sundae, or mm, an ice cream float. I gotta tell you, there's nothing that brings back memories like places like these. Today, we're getting the scoop and diving into the history of America's beloved sweet shops. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're gonna learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. It's no coincidence that here at the Lexington Candy Shop, one of New York City's most iconic soda fountains, they serve ice cream from the city of brotherly love. It's Bassett's, the oldest ice cream company in America. In fact, Philadelphia is home to many early ice cream innovations. And at the Franklin Fountain, we've got two brothers who have recreated a turn-of-the-century fountain that celebrates Philadelphia's unique contribution to American ice cream history. We're very proud to be called Soda Jerks. In the heyday of soda fountains, being called a jerk was a good thing. A soda jerk is someone that jerks the handle on the soda fountain. We are the Burley Brothers. I'm Ryan. And I'm Eric Burley. Welcome. Come on in. Stepping into the Franklin Fountain is like time traveling to a bygone era. I've always felt a kinship for the turn of the century. It just feels like maybe I was there in a past life. The Burley family originally purchasing this historic property in 2002, but they weren't sure what to do with the storefront until inspiration struck. The building is really what inspired us uh, to do what we do here. It was built around 1899, and the original tin ceiling remains as well as the penny tile floor. So we really thought that a soda fountain kind of looked right for the space. There's certainly a sense of awe and wonder, sort of a, a transport through the time machine when you walk in the door, and that was really intentional. The brothers working for nearly two years to restore the space. It is not for the faint of heart to restore any old building. It's a labor of love. And frankly, we wouldn't have it any other way. It's part of the handmade nature of everything that we do here. The kitchen itself was a preservation element, restoring the motor on the buttercream machine, fixing the belts. You know, the restoration of the building wasn't just the facade, but it's also the back of house spaces. They also embarked on a mission to recreate an authentic fountain experience. We took a number of road trips, in part to learn about the ice cream business, and then we would always pair soda fountain tours with those. So visiting places in the American South, going down to New Orleans, going to Savannah, seeing these old fashioned soda fountain places, interviewing the soda jerks, the pharmacists, and really learning the culture of the soda fountain was 
a big part of our research. Today, while we may take the simple pleasure of eating an ice cream cone for granted, that wasn't always the case. I'm Sarah Lohman. I'm a food historian, author, and ice cream expert. Let's go back to when ice cream was a luxury, largely available to only the richest of Americans. We don't think of these as expensive ingredients today, but ice and sugar historically were very rare, and so only the wealthiest people could afford them. So it was usually made in the home, and by home I mean a large grand estate, by people who had servants, and then eventually people who owned other people. We're talking about the enslaved. So you also needed that literal manpower to make it. That all begins to change in the 19th century as technology and supplies change. Traditionally, European ice cream was made with a custard base that included eggs. But a simpler style emerged in Philadelphia. I think Philadelphia is the most important city to ice cream history, maybe Pennsylvania as a whole, because we had the invention of Philadelphia style ice cream by a black man. Augustus Jackson, a black man who was a White House chef working under multiple presidents, including Andrew Jackson, is credited with advancing a new type of ice cream and method. And he came up with an ice cream base that didn't use eggs, but was just as like creamy and luscious, but could be made with less ingredients, made quicker. And he supposedly had really, really tasty flavors too. A free man. He later moved back to his native Philadelphia to start his own business. So he made it and sold it, but then he also sold it to other ice cream shops too, and became very famous and very wealthy for this new style of ice cream. Jackson's contributions made ice cream more widely available to more consumers. Philadelphia is also home to the oldest ice cream company in America, Bassett's. I'm Alex Bassett Strange, was my great, great, great grandfather that started this company all the way back in 1861. And we're proud to be here today. Bassett's was the first merchant to sign a lease in Philadelphia's historic Reading Terminal Market. And the family is still there serving up scoops today. Bassett's ice cream is a 16.5% butterfat ice cream, and it's what's called a Philadelphia style, which means that it's made without any egg yolk. Innovations to ice cream production, allowing more shops like Bassett's to open up in the early 1900s, and that ushered in a new type of meeting place where folks could socialize. And then we also had ice cream saloons. Now, the name there is key, saloon, yeah, means bar. And at this time, bars were places where only men could go, but ice cream saloons were one of the first public spaces that was socially acceptable for women to go to. So to have a public space was really meaningful to women. To have a space where you felt free, to have a space where you could safely flirt. Soda fountains and parlors became even more popular and almost necessary during the 1920s. When prohibition hits and we ban the sale of alcohol, then there's really a need for these public spaces for people to gather and socialize outside of the home. And as we move into the soda fountain era, we have a lot of creativity in adding ice cream to different flavors of soda and making these incredible concoctions and sundaes. If you were a soda jerk at the turn of the century, you were kind of a local celebrity. Today, the jerks in charge at Franklin Fountain are serving up nostalgia along with their vintage creations. It's one of our newer uh, soda syrups. It's uh, made with real watermelon fruit. Come over here to our 1905 soda fountain. Yeah. Mm, that is really good. Uh, you know, I don't want to mess with that flavor too much, so I'll just go with vanilla. Uh, vanilla ice cream just rounds everything out nice, plays nice at the playground. And the bean specks on the vanilla show that it's made with real vanilla, not vanillin. And that's an old Philadelphia tradition of having bean specks in their vanilla ice cream. Franklin Fountain's menu focuses on classics, but they also bring back long forgotten flavors. Summer hits like black walnut that tend to be kind of bitter, but mixed with enough sweetness can be really unique and good. Other flavors like pawpaws, which are our native fruit here in North America. While others 
misses. Uh, a flavor that kind of bombed here, uh, as an example, I'll tell you, it was orange pineapple. Like we really wanted to bring back orange pineapple as an ice cream, which was really popular at the turn of the century. But the Burleys aren't just passionate about their flavors. They are working to keep a tasty tradition alive. Our business has really enabled the preservation of a couple of historic buildings here on the block. And we hope that the, the fountain and the institution of the soda fountain continues and you know can be passed to succeeding generations of uh, soda jerks. Coming up, I visit a family-owned ice cream shop in Harlem and get a sweet surprise. This is what it looks and feels the latest like. Film. The bigger piece of the puzzle. We begin comes. tonight with breaking news. How much water ultimately will be forced inland? Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. It's the best time of the morning. Time for the pop star, baby. Oh, I'm feeling the vibe today on the show. I think when you open your eyes, you get to decide. How's my day going to be? We want to be a way to start your day. Lighten your load every single morning. How many of you were up there? At least like 11. How real is this going back to the moon? How you doing, Lester? You get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love ya. Love you too. <laughs> Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. What do people need most right now? Did the state and or law enforcement drop the ball? Migrant families now stranded in Mexico. What's the World Cup experience been like? It's your news playlist. Top story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. It's the best time of the morning, time for the pop star, baby. I'm feeling the vibe today on the show. Finish this sentence. Ice cream is... Love. Ice cream is not easy to make. <laughs> <laughs> and see. We're up here in Harlem, where the forecast is partly cloudy with a 100% chance of sprinkles. Why? Because we're outside Sugar Hill Creamery, where they're bringing the community together one scoop at a time. Let's check it out. Hey guys, nice to meet you. Hi, How it's nice to you? meet you. That's Nick and Petrushka Larson, husband and wife, and parents to Isla, Zadie, and Nico. So let's talk ice cream. They're also the owners of Harlem's Sugar Hill Creamery, which the couple opened in their beloved neighborhood in 2017. We're gonna give you the scoop. Ow. Bam! For the couple, that bam moment came after meeting up with friends in DC for some premium scoops. We had small batch delicious ice cream, and that is when it hit us that this was not an experience that we could have in our own neighborhood. The realization that they couldn't do this in Harlem was the beginning of their sweet journey. When Nick and I started dating, he always said he wanted to own a food establishment of some sort. And then this, you know, moment in life kind of presented the opportunity. Patricia oversees the shop's marketing and business, while Nick, well, he develops their artisanal flavors, often looking to the neighborhood for inspiration. The great thing about having a small shop, you see in real time, oh yeah, they don't like this, <laughs> right? And, and our, you know, and our friends from Harlem, they are not shy to be like, yo, no, no, this is no yeah. good. <laughs> so your flavors are nods to Harlem. Not to Harlem, not to our respective cultures as well. So my, I'm black, African American, and from the Caribbean. And Nick is from the Midwest and was raised on a farm. We're channeling Harlem, we're channeling childhood memories, we're channeling the way that we were raised, what we were eating. I think this is the best uh, example of channeling our neighborhood. So we have a, a, a flavor called Cafe Tuba. And where the first location is, it's like a few blocks from Little Senegal. The flavor Cafe Tuba uses coffee from Senegal. We incorporate peanut brittle and the lean pepper brownies. Mm. So it's a bit of a twist on a classic, which we like to say we make, you know, twists on classics and then all their flavors that you wouldn't expect. Many features of the scoop shop pay homage to Harlem, starting with the name. Where we're sitting right now is a neighborhood that is adjacent to Sugar Hill. Sugar Hill is a neighborhood in Harlem that at the turn of the 20th century was the, the place where 
upwardly mobile black people resided and, and came to, right? It was also the home of the Harlem Renaissance too. Many artists, activists were living here. You know, you talk about the history and homages to this neighborhood. Uh, was there some thoughts about the, that historic uh, ice cream shop, Bumford's? Yes! Just before opening Sugar Hill, Patricia learned about an iconic Harlem institution, Tomford's. Small group of octogenarian Harlemites that just happened to be at this conference, and they were like, hey, she's opening an happy ice cream shop. This is crazy. And they're like, oh my gosh, it'll, it's like Tomford's. Tomford's was in business from 1903 to 1983, located in the heart of Harlem at 125th and St. Nicholas. Unlike many early soda fountains, it catered to black patrons, providing much more than food and ice cream. It was the place that people went after, you know, church uh, on a date. And we didn't know about it when we decided to open the shop. But after we learned about it, before we opened the shop, we definitely channeled the, the history and spirit of that place here. Sugar Hill's motto, the sweet life is a love affair between community and food. And it also has a historical meaning. The sweet life is also you know, a reference to the Great Migration. You know, when people moved to Sugar Hill, they were looking for the sweet life. We wanted to give our neighbors a little bit of sweet life as well, right? Nick and Petrushka are hopeful that their spot will become the place for making family memories down the line. Later down the line is to hear stories like people talking about Tom Ford's or talking about what, you know, what we meant to them, right? To be a place where somebody could come in and say, my parents met here. What an honor. And I, think, I don't think that we take our role as, you know, the people who created this company lightly. Like, it is such an honor to be able to serve our neighbors and to also be a place that they continue to come back to. I think that a lot of us have really fond memories of going with our family um, and having ice cream on a hot summer day, or like rolling past a rural ice cream stand and it's just like packed with little league kids. Or when you live in a city, you've got your local ice cream place that you can walk to and the whole neighborhood is there. And as for the future of Sugar Hill Creamery? With, with three kids, uh, Nick, are, are you hoping that out of those three, one of them is going to carry on the tradition? It's a tricky question. Yes, I would, but you know, I'm not going to pressure them. At the very least, we need them to work here during exactly. high school. Exactly. Okay? Like, like, like. It's the best time of the morning. Time for the pop star, baby. Oh, I'm feeling the vibe today on the show. No stress, no mess, just yum. That's it. NBC News, streaming free now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. For Dateline Premium, subscribe now on Apple Podcasts. Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. I love mornings. They're full of possibility. And how you start your day sets the tone for the whole day. We feel like we're right there with you. Because every day we start our morning so you can take on yours. It's the best time of the morning. Time for pop star, baby. I'm feeling the vibe today on the show. For Dateline Premium, subscribe now on Apple Podcasts. Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. You get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love ya. Love you too. <laughs> it's the best time of the morning. Time for the pop star, baby. Oh, I'm feeling the vibe today on the show. It's time for Sunday School. Say amen. Say hallelujah. <laughs> amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> My Sunday school teachers at Harlem Sugar Hill Creamery kicked off my lesson with a special treat, a one-of-a-kind flavor made just for me. You should 
learn to scoop with your own, my own flavor. Your own flavor. My own flavor. Yeah. Wow. All of the ice cream served at Sugar Hill Creamery is small batch, each flavor taking two days from start to finish. The difference between a small batch and large batch is one is a freezer. These machines allow more experimentation with mixins. The reason why it's homemade and why it's better to use a small batch, for example, is you have freedom to do whatever the hell you want. You're not beholden to what can fit into a automated machine that, like, for example, can't put a particular like sauce in it because it'll be too thick or you know jam something you know things like that and now back to Sunday school so what's my flavor so your flavor so we've heard around the way uh -huh. that you uh, that you're a friend you're a fan of cookies and cream I am also you like sweet potato pie so I do okay so this is a combination and pecans of, well right? the pecan element is yeah. a part of the sweet potato pie but, but yeah. yes I can tell you guys are married <laughs> For my signature flavor, Nick started with a sweet cream base, then adding vanilla wafers. Blended in, made a uh, graham cracker pie crust or pecan, uh, roast sweet potatoes, cook it uh, down with basically it's a holiday IPA, mm -hmm. and uh, poured the beer in it, blended it up, and then made it like a custard with, uh, with eggs. Wow. A lot goes into that. A lot goes into it. And a lot goes into forming the perfect scoop. But picture-perfect scoops wouldn't be the same without one very important invention. The ice cream scoop was invented by a black man. Alfred Crawley holds a patent for the ice cream mold and disher. And that's the scoop that's like, it has a little handle that you squeeze and the thing scrapes and the ice cream plops out. Uh, but he invented that in 1897 and sort of revolutionized ice cream culture. So the side here is to form it, the tip is to like kind of scrape it, right? So if you're like just learning, the best way is just a little bit at the top, like that. Sides and boom. And you form it with the side. Oh, right? so you're forming the ball. The ball, the yeah, exactly. All right, voila. Ta-da. Right. So, the cup, got a little rinse. A rinse. Okay, so you, you start. You can well, also uh, grab out the sides there too, because oh, it's a little, little softer. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a sad yeah. scoop. No, 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 look, now good. you're gonna form oh, it. Oh, now it's forming. Now you're, mm -hmm. now it's forming. Oh, yep, look, at, look that at that now. Oh, See? hey, now we're talking. There it is. Wow. There it is. That's good. Hey, now. All right, let's taste. All, All right. right, time to taste. The Al Roker. Cheers. Well, actually. Oh, we also have a special name for it. Oh, what's that? It's uh, your neck of the woods. Oh, I like it. Get it. <laughs> wow. And this, this is, is great. Yeah. Like all Sugar Hill flavors, there's an art to naming the ice cream. For example, their best-selling blueberry cheesecake? Well, it's named for Petrushka. So this is uh, named after my wife, who's the chairperson of the board. She's the boss. This is the boss flavor. Smart man. <laughs> this, is the, this is the chief. Ooh, that's good. Yeah. Mm. My work here is done. Coming up, a whimsical creamery in Las Vegas, known for its colorful creations. How many of you were up there? At least like 11. How real is this going back to the moon? Thank you, I'm For Dateline Premium, subscribe now on Apple Podcasts. We begin tonight with breaking news just coming in. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. I think when you open your eyes, you get to decide, how's my day going to be? We want to be a way to start your day, lighten your load, every single morning. For Dateline Premium, subscribe now on Apple Podcasts. You get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love ya. I love you too. <laughs> you don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. You get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love ya. I love you too. <laughs> you know the old saying, 
What happens in Vegas doesn't always stay in Vegas, especially when it comes to a hot spot that's known for creating really cool desserts, Creamberry. These folks are recreating the ice cream parlor experience for a whole new generation of ice cream fans. And whether that's in person or via social media posts. Selfie anyone? I've seen some kids who can kill the burrito by themselves. Most adults, it's funny, they would share. <laughs> in Las Vegas, a few miles off the strip, is the flashy, fabulous, and insta-famous ice cream shop, Creamberry, opened in 2016 by husband and wife team Danny and Rosalina C., hoping to create a one-stop dessert cafe. We set on a mission to bring in a wide variety of crazy, innovative desserts into one place. For Danny, it was a dream come true. I've always had a sweet tooth when I was younger, and I've always loved ice cream. Rosalina, not so much right away. She favored traditional icy desserts from her native Indonesia, not American ice cream. We love sweet stuff, but we don't uh, really love like ice cream, ice cream, but more to like shave ice. I said, why don't we bring our Indonesia dessert to our menu? And just like that, Creamberry started offering shaved ice. So we have the secret ingredients, which is the sauce, the red one, that make it very good with the condensed milk, with everything fruit on top for the shave ice, and then it's a good combination. Danny's focus was on the full menu, adding unique treats from around the world to Creamberry, desserts like Thai rolled ice cream and Filipino halo halo. Recognizing the power of social media, Rosalina began posting photos and videos of their decadent creations to Instagram, and then later to TikTok. It's a practice that keeps modern ice cream parlors relevant, according to food historian Sarah Lohman. I think social media is important because, I mean, there's, there's people out there who are following ice cream places that maybe, maybe they'll go to, maybe they'll never go to, but it's like the visual appeal. Most people who buy cookbooks don't actually cook the recipes. It's like they flip through the pages to go on a journey. I think like social media and like ice cream social media lets us do that as well. One of their most eye-catching treats, the legendary cotton candy burrito, a social media and IRL favorite. Ooh, another one, maybe, ooh, look at this, the giant burrito. Oh, the birthday burrito. Yeah, the birthday burrito. I think that should be perfect for today. Hashtag genius. The cotton candy burrito proves that something savory can be the sweetest inspiration. I was having Mexican dinner one night and uh, of course eating burritos and tacos. That's where it gave me the idea, hey, why don't I try to experiment this into a dessert? And long behold, it actually worked. Rosalina was immediately impressed. I was like, man, that's a good idea. Creamberry was one of the first shops in the U.S. to offer the viral treat, but it took a few tries to perfect. As everybody knows, cotton candy is very fragile, and any type of a moisture or it will just ruin the cotton candy. The first step in the process isn't posted on social media. Spinning of the cotton candy is one of our trade secrets for our cotton candy burrito. So we, we usually spin it in the back in the kitchen. The couple's young sons also deserve a shout out for their love of cotton candy and its impact on their business. Our kids love cotton candy, so that's why that's the first time that we bring the cotton candy to our shop. So what's more important, how their desserts look or how they taste? Both. Both. <laughs> if customers come in and they're visually attracted to it and they try it and it doesn't taste good, they're not going to come back mm. and, and get the same dessert. So we eat with our eyes, right? So there's always been effort and consideration to the appearance of food, but the more photographs we can take and the wider they get spread, like with the spread of Instagram and social media, I think there's been even more of a sort of focus on how our food looks on camera. And ice cream is sort of the perfect medium for that. Like you can have a really wild color. You can have this like a really elaborate sundae, or you can have something that's just like really bold and beautiful. And luckily, because it's ice cream, it all still tastes good while looking good at the same time. Other Insta and TikTok worthy finds include their made to order ice cream tacos and wild milkshakes. 
For Rosalina, the more social interaction, the better. We really love to see the comments, how many likes we got, and then, you know, like a lot of people repost it too. And those comments, good and bad, help the duo refine their creations. Sometimes people say, oh, don't put too much sprinkle candy or whatever it is. And then sometimes we take it like, oh yeah, maybe not too much, it's maybe only a little bit. Yeah, it's very helpful for us yes. as well because then at least we can adjust what, what is necessary and to accommodate the customers. The virtual shares are sweet, but it's even sweeter when followers from around the world get to try Greenberry. We can never get enough of seeing all the smiles when the customers get their orders. Just the, the facial expression that they give us. In an era when we're bombarded with options, the simple joy of heading out for ice cream has withstood the test of time. I think that ice cream shops, spaces, parlors, ice creameries have survived because they've always fulfilled that community space and that family space. It's something that everybody can come together around. And families behind the counter will keep scooping up sweet memories for years to come. to the boost today's show is full of heartwarming stories to brighten up your day including some from our very own harry smith but we are going to start with our discover black heritage series spotlighting an inspiring woman who is breaking barriers on the beloved show sesame street as the song goes can you tell me how to get to sesame street we found out from their newest puppeteer megan pifus peace who's been blazing trails just like the show always has. Well, we're here sitting on the stoop at 123 Sesame yes. Street. What are your early memories of, of this program? All of the characters here were my friends. I watched them every day. I had a personal connection with the street. When I was three years old, I had a Sesame Street birthday party. We had a Sesame Street cake and an Elmo walk around character came out and Big Bird. Those friends would help her find her passion. When I was 10 years old, I had just changed to a new elementary school and had to make new friends. I was super shy. I went to a puppetry conference with a few members from my church. I was exposed to women ventriloquists and I saw myself being able to open up just like them and uh, make something come alive in that moment. So I went home, I told my parents I wanted to become a ventriloquist. Megan's mom, checking out VHS tapes from the library for her daughter. And Megan watched them over and over, starting to mimic them. I took my puppets to school and was cracking jokes during lunch break. And my teachers noticed and asked if I would perform in front of the whole school. Mm -hmm. That was my very first performance. And what made me knew in that moment that that's what I wanted to do forever, to hold the attention of kids anywhere from three years old to 12 and make them laugh and smile, that became my joy. That joy continuing as she performed, seeing an opportunity to express herself. You're so little, you don't go very far. Becoming known as the valedictorian ventriloquist. We all will go far, if we are willing. And go far she did, even taking her act on America's Got Talent. A stolen oh, wow. is all After graduating from Vanderbilt with degrees in economics and finance, she spent seven years in commercial real estate until... I found the Instagram page of the performer who does Abby Kadabi, Leslie Carrera Rudolph, and I just fangirled. I said, oh my God, I love your character and what you do with her. She DM'd me and said, you are a gift. What was it like when you first heard from Megan? There was something super warm and heartfelt about it. And so I, I went and I, I, I Googled her and I was blown away. I just felt like it was magic. Mm -hmm. I know that sounds really corny, but I do feel feel like it was a meeting of the hearts. Leslie was so impressed with Megan's talents, she became her mentor, sharing her material with Sesame's producer who invited Megan to audition. Last September, making history as the street's first full-time black female puppeteer. I immediately entered my the imagination of my childhood. I still wish I could figure out what kind of job I want to do when I grow up. 
and entering the imagination of a lot of kids with six and three quarter year old Gabrielle. What is it like being here on Sesame Street? Oh, it's so much fun. Oh, the weather is always great. It's always sunny. Mm -hmm. You know, you should really consider being a meteorologist here. Megan, hoping her path to the pinnacle of puppetry inspires others. My goal is just to inspire girls to achieve whatever dream they have, mm -hmm. no matter their background, their zip code, or no matter the color of their skin. Sesame's executive producer believes representation is important. We want people to be able to see characters on screen and feel like they see themselves. Those friends that inspired her as a child are her best friends today. Who are some of your friends? Tell me about oh, well, them. Well, I got lots of friends. Mm -hmm. I got um, Prairie Dog, uh -huh. Abby, mm -hmm. Elmo, mm -hmm. Cookie Monster, mm -hmm. Gonger, mm -hmm. Grover, yeah. uh, Big Bird. Yeah. So nice to meet you, Gabrielle. Oh, it's so nice to meet you too, Mr. Al. High five. Yeah. Woo! Woo! This boom. 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 Coming up next, guys, a story on the power of kindness. How one teacher changed the lives of her students with one phone call. Take a look. Fate has brought us together nearly 40 years ago when I was a poor immigrant starting seventh grade, not speaking a word of English. Somehow, some way, you saw the best in me. In May of 1983, 12-year-old Esther Lim and her family emigrated from South Korea to Edgewood, Maryland, where her father hoped for better education and opportunities for his family. What was school like? I was so scared. Couldn't speak a word of English. Being in a whole new country, no friends, and starting at a brand new school where I was the only Asian. What happened next? I met my first angel in America. Mrs. Jean Herbert met Esther during her first year of teaching. It was a lifelong dream job she finally realized at the age of 45 after graduating from Towson University. I could see in her right away that there was something that was inherent and it needed to be nurtured. How did you decide to help better that situation? I called her father and I said, please get your daughter some help this summer. And so he says to me, uh, you teach? <laughs> and from somewhere came this voice out of me that said, well, I could try that. But then he said, I have three other children. You teach? I hear myself say again, well, we could do that. And then he said, and my wife? <laughs> so you see my kitchen table in yes. the background. So all summer, six of us sat around that table and wow. we learned English. You also didn't ask for a single penny. But I knew that they didn't have the money and I knew they certainly had the need. I think really through this life, that's what we're called to do is to help one another. After graduation, Esther also attended Towson University along with her older sister, Mary. There, the bonds between the two families became even closer while the two sisters lived with Mrs. Herbert's mother. They could not afford to be in a dorm, that kind of thing. They had a need, so I talked my mother into it. I didn't have to talk very hard. Oh, there and she is. is. Today, Esther is an accomplished lawyer in Washington, D.C. and served as president of the D.C. Bar. I cannot tell you how proud I am of this girl. Mm -hmm. I'm oh. giving you all the credit. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't have to. <laughs> I want to. I, I don't know. <laughs> they were easy to love. Esther, I know that you have a letter that you'd like to share. Dear Mrs. Herbert, from the first day in your science class, you made me feel seen and loved. The stepping stones leading to my career can be traced back to you being my first teacher in America. Thank you for becoming a teacher and for being mine. <laughs> oh, yes, honey. Well, I have a letter I'd like to share with you. Towson University's College of Education is excited to announce the establishment of the Mrs. Jean Herbert Scholarship Fund. Oh, that's wonderful. 
through the Bojangles Foundation, Bojangles is donating $10,000 to the scholarship. That's wonderful. As well as 100 books to TU's English Language Learners Library oh. in your name. Oh Please. my goodness, that's just wonderful. Thank you. It is such a fitting tribute to celebrate Mrs. Herbert for all the teachers around the country who give selflessly day in and day out. I don't know what to say. It really takes my breath away. Come on, that's a great way to start our show. Don't go away. After the break, we're gonna take a dive into one of my personal passions. For Dateline Premium, subscribe now on Apple Podcasts. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. This is what it looks and feels like. the latest film? The bigger piece of the puzzle. We begin tonight with breaking news. How much water ultimately will be forced inland? Whenever it happens, wherever you are. NBC News, streaming free now. No stress, no mess, just yum. That's it. Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. You get one beautiful so life to live. What are you going to do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world to me. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm gonna go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the I way. Love riding. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Oh, yeah, I love you too. It's the best time of the morning. Time for the pop star, baby. Oh, I'm feeling the vibe today on the show. Welcome back to The Boost. Okay, if you know me, you know I love country music. NBC's Morgan Radford introduces us to artists changing the industry. From its bluegrass roots to a modern pop feel, country music has always evolved to include new sounds. And now it includes some new faces, too. Black artists like Kane Brown, Mickey Guyton, and Willie Jones, racing up the charts as part of a new group of country music stars. Among them, Michael and Tanya Trotter. too much fun. <laughs> the husband and wife duo known as the War and Treaty. We try to find a genre that would represent all of our experiences. The genre that will carry the sacredness of gospel, that will give the heartbreak of blues, and a genre that will celebrate our faith in God. I feel like country music embodies all of those things. I but it's a genre where artists who look like them haven't always been included. Of the more than 11,000 songs played on country radio for the past 18 years, fewer than 1% were by black artists. Now, that landscape is changing, with radio play for black, indigenous, and people of color increasing by 3.5%, challenging perceptions for both white audiences and black. In the black American neighborhoods, the sound of our city uh, especially growing up in Cleveland, Ohio, in, in the 90s was Bone Thugs and Harmony, Big, Tupac. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah. <laughs> Said it all. When that unspoken bond is broken, like you're not singing R&B, you're not doing soul music, that's for the other folk. And, you know, then you get labeled, that's the sound of the sellout. Prompting a conversation about race that dates back generations, from country's roots and music created by enslaved Africans, to minstrel shows featuring white performers in blackface who twisted black music into cruel stereotypes. Author Francesca Royster has written a book about country music's roots and its often unacknowledged debt to black Americans. Country music is black music, but I think part of where the, the negative part of that history happens is where there's a deliberate silencing of 
some of the origins and the roots of that music. Which is why the Trotters see their success as part of a larger message. When you look five years down the line, 10 years down the line, what do you hope this space looks like? Hopefully we're blazing that trail so that there are many more of us doing it. Linking countries past to a more inclusive future. Turning now to a nonprofit that's seeking to unify our country one conversation at a time. I am nervous. I am excited. I am coming into this with an open heart and an open mind. I am very excited to see how this turns out, what we have in common, and what differences we have, and how that can still unite us. In Wichita, Kansas, strangers Lamisha Courtney and Brandy Hibbs are about to meet for the first time. This scheduled coming together of strangers is all part of the nonprofit One Small Step, which hosts and records 50 minute conversations between people with different political views. Prior to the conversation, Misha and Brandy were given each other's bios. I know she's a single mom, has three children. She is um, from a family of six that she has children of her own, that her father was in the military. One Small Step founder Dave Isay is on a crusade to unify our country, one conversation at a time. You know, if we spent more time listening to each other and less time screaming at each other and hating each other, what a better and stronger country it would be. One Small Step uses contact theory psychology under the premise that it's hard to hate up close. Part of the secret sauce of One Small Step is that we don't talk about politics. This is just about two human beings looking each other in the eye and talking about what really matters to them. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> A facilitator handed them their first question. So Brandy, tell me about one or two people in your life who have had the biggest influence on you. A place they found common ground. I have to say my parents hands down. They had me when they were super young um, and we're not prepared to be parents. I would say the exact same. Um, my parents were and still are some of the most important people to me. So when you were talking about your parents, like I was like, oh gosh, that's me too. They soon discovered differences on some hot button issues. I'm definitely more on the conservative side. I am very pro-life. My faith as being a Christian, definitely something that has molded me to who I am, but also shaped my beliefs. Certain segments of the population say pro-life, but don't want to have gun laws in place that stop the lives of innocent children in schools being killed. Personally, you know, being an open carrier myself, um, I prefer that. I'd rather see it and know who's got it, but I still think there should be training that's involved um, in the handling of the weapons and the safety of the weapons and things like that. Misha shared her biggest for, fears as a mother. People talk about Black Lives Matter and, oh, we don't like them because they start. No, what we're trying to say is that we want our lives to matter just as much as anybody else's lives. I don't want to have to worry about my children walking the street in my neighborhood and never coming home. I worry when they go to the snow cone stand with their friends that don't look like them. And I just wish we lived in a world where I didn't have to worry about that. I wish I had the words to respond because honestly, um, and it's it's something that you know I've I've thought about, but I I don't understand it. If there's something I can do to increase my knowledge and learn more about your perspective, then I'm all for it. In the end, they found some common ground. Your desire to want to know more or saying, what can I do? That's the first step. Sure. Just, okay, being willing to, okay, I don't understand. How can I understand or what can I, who can I talk to, what can I learn? And so even a new friendship. <laughs> I've found a, a friend um, with Misha um, and, and I'd love to be able to keep in touch. So I didn't come looking for a friend, but I think I found one. Every interview ends the same way. It almost belies belief. You know, it decreases fear of the other and, and it allows us to see the human being and the American sitting across from us. And we've got another one for you today. Take a look. I think we know how this story begins. In a tiny basement studio in Portland, Oregon, 
There's something special about the lyrics floating in the air. They are still strangers at this point. This modern day bard is writing ballads about ordinary everyday people. Tiny anthems is a system where you give me information about your sister or your husband. I will then compose a song. And it all started with an offer to write a song about anyone for two bucks and quickly snowballed into Mike Long's life's work. Today, Mike charges about $300 per song, putting more than 20 hours each into the composition. There's just like something absurd about what I'm doing that just makes me want to keep doing it. Devs a grain and gristle when Sid comes sailing in. He's now written and composed hundreds of tiny anthems, each created for an audience of one. I've never experienced a gift like that before. For Dev Sirk and Sid Snyder, Tiny Anthems has become the soundtrack of their lives. There are very few people in this world that have a love song written about them. That is so true, and we have three of them. And Mike's creative process can be as unpredictable as his lyrics. His orchestra, just about anything that makes a sound. And watching him create music from thin air is simply magical. Moments later, yet another sound ready to celebrate that indescribable essence that makes each one of us so unique. If you get close enough to a person, you'll find something to love about them. Gotti Schwartz, NBC News, Portland, Oregon. Stay with us. We'll have more after the break. Hey, podcast fans. Ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content. And everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. You'll get one beautiful life to live. What are you going to do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm going to go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the I way. love riding the way. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. I love you. I love you too. <laughs> How many of you were up there? At least like 11. How real is this going back to the moon? Thank you, Uncle Lester. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. How many of you were up there? At least like 11. How real is this going back to the moon? Thank you, Uncle Lester. You'll get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love you. I love you too. <laughs> For Dateline Premium, subscribe now on Apple Podcasts. I think when you open your eyes, you get to decide, how's my day going to be? We want to be a way to start your day. Lighten your load every single morning. Welcome back. We are melting away the winter blues here on The Boost. And one small town is doing the same. NBC's Harry Smith visited a community that came together to create a winter wonderland. In these days when it feels like there's more going on that pulls us apart than that which draws us together, we present this contradiction the brand new ice rink in Springfield, New York. I mean, it's just crazy. It's like this every day here. Galen Crickey is the town supervisor. The day we visited, wind chill was six below zero. And this kind of weather, people out here shoveling away and people donating skates. We have 50 pairs of skates and they're all donated. Kids, adults, beginners, all are welcome. And by the looks of it, all are darn happy to be here. <laughs> How big of a plus has this been for your town? Oh gosh, huge, huge, very big. There's not a lot to do here in the winter. Maggie Picorni teaches middle school and comes here often to unwind. People come and want to get out, you know, after work, after school, get some fresh air. It's a great place to be. It sure looked great to us, 
and how we wondered did this come to be? A $5,000 budget and a vision. I thought about it for two weeks and it kept nagging at me and nagging at me and I was nervous because I knew it was going to be a lot of work. But when you have an idea that strong, you can't ignore it. The frozen equivalent of Field of Dreams, says Ashley Sykema, who runs the parks here. When we built it, we started saying, if you build it, they will come. And they came. <laughs> and they keep coming more and more every day. Built in large part by town folk, ultra-capable Amish neighbors who already had ranks of their own. Out of respect for the Amish, we blurred some images. None of them would take any payment. The town offered to pay them, and they wouldn't take any payment. And Amish man, Wayne Stutzman, who led the effort, even came up with a backyard version of a Zamboni to keep the ice smooth. Normally, we're out here for at least two, at least. Uh, we're coming up, I think we're coming up on four hours now, so. Uh. Benjamin Munyon and his daughter Bridget are here most every day. How much do you like coming out to the skating rink? I like it a lot. You like it a lot. <laughs> I can tell, because I see no sign in you four hours in of like, it's time to go, Dad. I don't see anybody. You're not tugging on your dad's sleeve. No. But I think we would spend all day out here if we could. It's not fancy, this ice rink, but it seems to function in a way that far exceeds anyone's expectations. When we all get together and we spend time together and we get to know each other and focus on what we have in common, that joy just builds and spreads. Imagine one of these in your town. You know what they say, if you build it. And Harry's got another heartwarming story for us on a restaurant proving that nothing compares to a grandma's cooking. It's like a dream. Your beloved grandmother in the kitchen preparing family favorites. Where were you born? In Italia. Is that where you learned how to cook? Yeah. yeah. My nonna, my mother. But Nona Maria cooks for customers, not your cousins, at a restaurant in Staten Island. Aren't you supposed to be retired? Uh, I like to work. I like to do. <laughs> you like to work? I like to come every day. Grandma's in the kitchen is the specialty of the house at Enoteca Maria. So it's magic. Owner and proprietor, Joe Scaravella. I think the whole attraction with grandmothers, uh, it's when you're growing up, it's, that's like your safe space. Over more than a decade, Scaravella has assembled a mini UN of abuelas, boobies, and nanas. Home cooking cuisines from Asia to the Middle East. Every night, a split menu, Italian and food from someplace else. Something sort of magic happens every evening here. We're always anticipating what the different Nonas bring. I think I know plenty of grandmothers that aren't that good at cooking, but, <laughs> but I've never seen one here. <laughs> yeah. oh, wow. You want to try this? Especially when Nona Maria is holding forth. You're a genius. Oh, yeah? Thank yeah. you. When I, I come inside, my face is smile. Ah, I feel so good. Us, too. Harry Smith, NBC News, Staten Island. Oh, come on. Doesn't that have you yearning for some home cooking? Stick with us. Your daily morning boost is now. You get one beautiful so life to live. What are you going to do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world to me. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm going to go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the I love ride. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Um, yeah. <laughs> we begin tonight with breaking news just coming in. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. What do people need most right now? Did the state and or law enforcement drop the ball? Migrant families now stranded in Mexico. What's the World Cup experience been like? It's your news playlist. Top story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Good morning. Welcome to today. I love mornings. They're full of possibility. And how you start your day sets the tone for the whole day. We need to pull up one extra chair at the table. We feel like we're right there with you. Because every day we start our morning 
so you can take on yours. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. We're wrapping up the boost with what else? Today's morning boost. Take a look. All right, we've got a New Jersey couple. They wanted to find the perfect way to tell their moms that they were expecting their first baby. So they printed out the ultrasound photos, they put them in a frame, and then they called the two moms over for the big reveal. Here's how it all went down. What is it? <laughs> Are you kidding? My kids are going to Are you kidding? She's pregnant! Oh my god. We've had to bleep a boost. We've had to bleep a grandma, too. Needless to say, the two women, Serafina and Connie, a little bit excited. Oh my god. Later, you can hear one of them yelling, We're grandmas! And they didn't want to lost control. Look at that. Okay, that little baby, can you imagine the love yeah. oh. that baby's way? I can also imagine the language that that baby's going to pick up. Oh. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. And that is it for the show here on Today All Day. Thanks for joining us. We love, love, love being able to bring you joy and positivity every single day. And guess what? We'll see you next week. Shop All Day contributor Chassis Post, and each week I'm here with the must-have fashion and beauty products at a price you'll like in Style Finder. I'm fashion and beauty expert Makon Jovo, and I'm bringing you industry insiders and those in the know to share all the buzzworthy products sweeping social media and influencer trends. And I'm Shop Today editorial director Adriana Brock, and I know shopping trends. I seek out new and notable products so you don't have to in editor's picks. This is Shop All Day, Ready, Set, Summer. Hi, I'm Shop All Day contributor Chassie Post, and we're back today with another episode of Shop All Day. Now today, we're bringing you sunshine and all things summer style, from matching swimsuits for the entire family, including the towel, to all of this season's sandal trends. And don't forget beauty and accessories for the warmer weather. We've got you covered. And remember, See that QR code at the corner of your screen? You can use the camera on your smartphone to scan it for instant access to the products on the show today. Or you can even text SHOP to the number below to shop all the products we're sharing with you today. So let's get to it. First, let's talk bathing suits. And newsflash, like many of you out there, I love, love, love a matching set. You can imagine my joy when I discovered these bold and coordinating beach towels from Old Navy with bathing suits to match. Oh my gosh, that would have been enough to make my entire week. But then, as I scroll down the page, I almost lost it. Turns out that there's even more matching to be had. Not only can you match your bathing suit to your towel, you can also match your bathing suit with your entire family. Yes! There are matching bathing suit styles for women, men, boys and girls, and they are really, really adorable. How fun are these prints? Pink flamingos, bold sunflowers. I love the yellow and black and the towels. It's so chic. And the matching trend is really big. And I think this would make such a cute family photo up and also a really cute idea for couples too. Next up, say hello to one of my favorite sporty trends of the season. Ta-da! It's the tennis court. Yes, tennis court slash all things tennis is shaping up to be one of the top trends of the summer. The beauty of the skirt, as you are likely aware, is that it is a skirt short hybrid. So it's a skirt with a built-in biking short underneath, which makes it an excellent option for any outdoor activity. But Here's the thing, especially with this black one, we're seeing women wear their skorts, not just for sporty endeavors, but pretty much everywhere. From shopping to lunch to lounging around the house. And how cute is this little skort? This is a really flattering silhouette. It's got a high waist, which is elastic. And check this out. I mean, loving, loving, loving the little pleating and Look at the shorts underneath. It's got two pockets here, and 
It's also got a little hidden zipper pocket in the waistband. And the brand says it's made out of a really light and breathable poly spandex blend with a little compression. So who doesn't love that, right? And it comes in 20 fun colors. So game, set, and match. This sporty squirt is a real winner. Moving on to one of my favorite accessories for summer, the straw bag. Yes, natural woven bags are one of the hottest accessory trends of the season. And I really, really love this stylish bag from Amazon. It's an affordable take on the trend, and it's made of rattan, which is a palm vine that it's been hand woven in this really beautiful herringbone pattern. Plus, straw is the perfect summer neutral. You really can wear it with anything. And I love how versatile these little bags are. You can take it from the beach to brunch and beyond. It's big enough to carry your essentials, your wallet, sunglasses, computer, towels, you name it. And I love this pom-pom detail. And it even has a removable tassel. So this bag is gonna take you anywhere you need to go this summer in style. And if you were curious about what shoes I'll be wearing all summer, then look no further than these two bestsellers. They're part of a big trend out there called recovery slides, which are sandals originally designed to help you recover after workouts. But they're also part of another less scientific trend called the squishy sandal trend. But regardless of what trend you assign them to, the bottom line is they are so comfy that you are never going to want to take them off your feet. I was introduced to this first pair from a brand called Ufos because my 10-year-old niece had them and she let me try them on. And that was it. I have been obsessed ever since. They are absolute comfort. And what makes them so dreamy is the foam technology. It feels like a thick arch supporting foam platform that the brand says absorbs more impact than traditional footwear. And according to the brand, the footbed is designed to reduce stress on knees, ankles, and other joints. And now for another fashion forward and affordable take on the recovery slide, we've also got a version of the squishy recovery sandal from Amazon. And shoppers call these loud slides and they live up to their name. I have a pair of these and you feel like you are walking on a fluffy cloud. So you can wear these everywhere from the beach to the pool to the gym, running around the house, running around town, or you can really just wear them anytime you want to make your feet happy. And I love all the colors. There's a great selection of both neutrals and brights, but I say go with the brights this summer. So next, let's talk about another slide trend that you are going to want to know about this summer, the braided slide. Yes, this trend might just be one of the biggest of the season, and you're gonna see this braided design detail pretty much everywhere. And these little takes from Nordstrom are an excellent example of the trend. I mean, they've got that great oversized braided strap, and it's actually padded, so it really makes a statement. Plus. These slides are no shrinking wallflowers. I love how they look on the foot. They've also got great details like the square toe silhouette, which we're also seeing everywhere. And they come in great neutrals, but I'm also really loving these new neutrals. Pastel yellow and purple are, in my view, the new neutrals of the summer. And surprisingly, they really do go with so much. So for the price, there is no better option for a wear anywhere on trend slide. And these really look expensive to me. Now, summer means sunshine and a perfect excuse for new sunnies. And I have one word for this pair, chic. And these I think are beautiful. Check out the tortoise detail. Tortoise is a really big trend we're seeing out there this summer, as well as the oversized retro look. I've got to tell you, this fabulous oversized shape really does look great on pretty much every face shape. And I think they look really expensive. And my favorite thing about this brand is that every time I wear these, someone asks me if they're by a high-end designer. And I say, no, they're not. You can have them too for under $30. And last but not least, I have been trying to get this set of resin acrylic cocktail rings into an episode for months. In fact, I brought mine from home 
I'm wearing one right now. <laughs> and big chunky acrylic or resin rings are a massive trend. And we've seen some very expensive offerings from major designers. So I was thrilled to find this set of five for such an affordable price. And what I think is so fun about a cocktail ring is they're sort of a statement look, right? But they're made out of acrylic or resin and they come in so many fun colors. I'm constantly wearing the clear or the black, but I can't wait to try out the white or the bright green this summer. I think they're gonna be so much fun. So let's run through all the products one more time. We've got the Old Navy beach towel and matching bathing suits, the pleated tennis skirt, the rattan bag with pom-poms, the recovery slides, the Luca slide sandal, the Peepers Tokyo Square tortoiseshell sunglasses, and the resin cocktail rings. And just so you know, Today works with affiliate partners and earns a commission on purchases made through our links at today.com. That's it for Style Finder. Up next, McCohen Lovu is talking to Florida Maria Rivera, who went from TV reporter to shoe designer. She'll walk us through more of this summer's shoe trends. Stay with us. What do people need most right now? Did the state and or law enforcement drop the ball? Migrant families now stranded in Mexico. What's the World Cup experience been like? It's your news playlist. Top story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. You get one beautiful life to live. What are you going to do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm going to go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the I way. love riding This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. I love you. I love you too. <laughs> You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. I think when you open your eyes, you get to decide, how's my day going to be? We want to be a way to start your day, lighten your load, every single morning. No stress, no mess, just yum. That's it. What do people need most right now? Did the state and or law enforcement drop the ball? Migrant families now stranded in Mexico. What's the World Cup experience been like? It's your news playlist. Top story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. For Dateline Premium, subscribe now on Apple Podcasts. How many of you were up there? At least like 11. How real is this going back to the moon? <laughs> How you doing, Lester? No stress, no mess, just yum. That's it. For Dateline Premium, subscribe now on Apple Podcasts. Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. It's the best time of the morning. Time for pop star, baby. Oh, I'm feeling the vibe today on the show. For Dateline Premium, subscribe now on Apple Podcasts. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Hi there. Welcome back. I'm Makon Jovu, and this is Influencer Trends, where I'll be talking to industry insiders, and they'll share their favorite products and the must-have items to shop for right now. And don't forget the QR code on the corner of your screen. Use the camera on your smartphone and scan it to shop these products. Summer is finally here and warmer weather brings new styles. And I'm excited because we have TV reporter turned entrepreneur Flor de Maria Rivera, who has her own shoe line. How fun is that to design shoes for a living? I love it. She's here with her favorite trends for this summer. Hi, Flor. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here with you, Mako. <laughs> wow, you're so talented. I mean, that goes oh. without saying, but your shoes are some of the, no lie, some of the most beautiful shoes I've seen. Like, really? Oh. Away. No, you're going to make me cry before. Yeah. <laughs> I still get so emotional over my shoes because it's been such a long journey, you know, to get to where I am, but I feel so blessed because 
so many celebrities have worn it and I'm self-funded and I've switched careers so many times in my life. And I mean, I'm 46, so people oh. told me I was crazy to start the line in my 40s, but I never listened to anybody. You're doing it. You look amazing. Oh, the shoes are amazing. I've been in shoe heaven with my own shoes for the past two and a half years. So it just, sometimes it just, it still feels like a dream. Yeah, what a wonderful dream to be in. So let's talk about your pivot. Because I think your story is so interesting. You're a sports anchor, and then you decided to design your own shoe collection. Do you remember the exact moment that you decided you wanted to go down that path? I've always wanted to do it, but I just felt like I was never ready. And then one day, I was actually at a lake. I was reading a book. And something in that book told me, this is the moment. And that's when I say, I am finally doing my shoe line. I am never going to be ready. And this is just the time. And that was summer of 2000. 17 and here we are <laughs> and here you are thriving and shining walk me through your inspiration right when you're designing the shoe do you get the idea in your head first or do you just kind of like jot it out as you go along that's an amazing question because there's so many different ways like the first season i actually had a mood board and my first collection was inspired by peru that's where i'm from that's where i was born and those are my roots but then later when the pandemic happened i just found myself not traveling as much and i found myself at home honestly if you walk into my house you'll find a little notebook in every little corner, sometimes I have ideas and I just start sketching away. And lately, I think that's what's happened. I don't even look at the mood board that I have. Inspiration just happened. The other day I was watching a movie and I thought of something and I think, Mako, it's going to be my hottest sandal yet. <laughs> oh, your hottest sandal. I don't know how you can pop this because this is a big thing. So the theme of the show is Ready, Set, Summer. And I'm just curious to know, like, what are some of the themes that we can expect to see or some of the trends that we can expect to see in the summer? As far as shoes goes, lace-ups. Lace-ups have been everywhere on the runways. You see one of my favorite styles. It was named after my grandma, Raquel. This is a nude color, and it pretty much goes with everything. And when I'm talking about lace-ups, this one can tie around the ankles, or it can also tie all the way up to your knees. Uh, so that's one choice. But then also I'm talking about lace-ups in the way that it's just a sexy estiletto that just wraps around the ankle. So that's one of the biggest trends uh, this season. Also so Michael, I know you loved it. And it's this bold color right here. Uh -huh. <laughs> the neon. Neons are huge in the summer. I mm. love the neon, but I also <laughs> love these as well. Can you tell me what inspired the collection? That one has a mixture of silk satin, it's got crystals and it also got pony hair. But then you usually are used to leopard in the brown and black shades, but I love going all out. I love a showstopper shoe. And that one is yellow with black leopard. I mean, I wish you guys could see the detail on this shoe, the straps. I mean, it's just so absolutely beautiful. How does it make you feel seeing celebrities wear your shoes? Because you were telling me earlier that you started, you know, later on in life in terms of designing shoes. What does it make you feel like when you see celebrities rocking your shoes? Uh, sometimes I honestly still can't believe it. And lately, I just get so teary-eyed because it's not only about this moment, but for me, it's always been following my dreams, especially my parents moved from Peru, left everything behind to give us a better life. And I want to honor that and I want to make them proud. So for me, it takes me back on time and all the sacrifices my parents have to do. And also as a Latina, as a woman, as a minority, as a woman of color, I hope and, and pray that I can open doors for those that come behind me or those that come alongside with me. Oh my gosh, how inspiring. I know your parents, your community, everyone is so proud of you. All right, the theme again is Ready, Set, Summer. So let's talk about sunglasses. These are so stylish, right? I love that they come in a bunch of different colorways, but they also have important functions. Can you tell me about them? Yes, so a sporting sunglasses. Ooh, my God, they look so good on you. <laughs> Thank you, Flor. Thank you. Sporty sunglasses are one of the hottest trends that we've seen on the runway. The reason why I love this one, do you like this one, Michael? I love the white, first of all. I love the pop of color. They look great on you. And don't they feel great too? Oh my God, they feel so lightweight. And the best thing is that they cost less than $25. So it is amazing. You don't need to spend hundreds of dollars to look good. So this is more of an angular style that it's also a hot trend. But if you notice, these ones are blue with the white. They can also come with different color lenses. So it just depends what you like. And if you're like me, I will rock this with something neon. <laughs> but it's also, if you're a minimalist, you can wear this with more of a neutral outfit and you can let the, the sunglasses stand out. 
speaking of accessories doing the talking, let's move on to this necklace. This necklace, Flora, just screams summer to me. How do you style it though? Do you wear it with like neutrals or you do pops of color? This is just beautiful pastel colors. So if you want to pick one of these colors, let's say the yellow or the coral, you can pick a dress or a top or anything that has one of those colors and you're set. And what I love about this necklace, it's a white 2 k trend that has come back. It's all over our closet. And now it's taking on to jewelry. So it's supposed to be a hottest trend for the summer as well. We saw it on the runway. This is a winning, winning necklace. Speaking of winning, uh, and TikTok trends. I've seen gua sha tools all over my social media, but Flora, tell me, what are the benefits of using gua sha? You know, I swear by this little stone, even though when beauty gadgets we have become so popular and some of them can cost hundreds of dollars, do you gua sha, Mako? You look like I you do. do. I do, I actually do. And I like that it like wakes up my face, especially when I wake up in the morning, right? So I usually do it in the morning. <laughs> I do it, don't forget about the neck. So I love to apply a little bit of oil right and then you just start on the neck move upwards Michael. right i love this round one and then like you did it before i love to go around my jawline after the neck and i just when i get to the end see i just stay there i do it at least five times in one section and then you work your way up and there's so many videos if you want to learn nowadays and I love like the one that you have, the rose quartz, but don't worry about trying different ones. The stone doesn't really matter. There is a jade and there's different ones. This one I just love because it pinks, it looks pretty in the it's vanity. So pretty. Isn't it and so it's pretty? So relaxing too. Like as we were trying yes. it, I instantly felt like, oh my God, imagine coming home after a long day, instant relaxation. So Flora, I love that you brought the self-tanner. Tell me how it's different from the other ones that are on the market. Yes, that's a Saint-Tropez one. I tried different one, but I think that one has become my favorite because not only it dries fast, but it just gives you the perfect golden tone. It's not too light, it's not too dark, but if you're trying a bronzer, make sure you use a glove because if you get it in your hand, sometimes it turn orange and it can be, yes, Michael, see, you know, you know. <laughs> it can turn, your hands can turn orange and trust me, it can take days to get that, rid of that. But I think that's a perfect one, you know, to just get your natural glow, like you just came back from vacation without having to go, you know, get a spray tan that those can be really expensive sometimes, or you don't, you know, you're not at the beach or you, you want to take care of your skin. I think that's always a, a great option. That's such a great point. Well, Flora, we are ready for summer. Thank you for stopping by <laughs> and giving us all these great selections. Have a great summer, okay? Thank you. Now, let's run through all the products one more time. The Flor de Maria sandals, the sporty sunglasses, the multicolored necklace, the gua sha tool, and the Centro Pay self-tan bronzing mousse. And just so you know, Flor de Maria once worked for Telemundo, which is part of our parent company, NBC Universal. Up next, Adriana Brock continues to soak in the sun with everything from accessories to keep you cool to solutions for slicing all that summer fruit. Don't go away. You get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love ya. <laughs> How many of you were up there? At least like 11. How real is this going back to the moon? Thank <laughs> you, on Lester. I love mornings. They're full of possibility. And how you start your day sets the tone for the whole day. We feel like we're right there with you. Because every day we start our morning so you can take on yours. For Dateline Premium, subscribe now on Apple Podcasts. I love mornings. They're full of possibility. And how you start your day sets the tone for the whole day. We feel like we're right there with you. Because every day we start our morning 
so you can take on yours. This is what it looks and feels like. the latest film? The bigger piece to the puzzle. We begin tonight with breaking news. How much water ultimately will be forced inland? Whenever it happens, wherever you are. NBC News, streaming free now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. We begin tonight with breaking news just coming in. Whenever it happens, wherever you are. NBC News, streaming free now. You get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love you. Love you too. <laughs> Hey everyone, welcome back. I'm Adriana Brock and now that summer is finally here, it is time to slip on your sandals and get ready for the pool and beach season. I cannot wait to show you my editor's picks. From accessories to keep you looking and feeling cool in the warmer weather, to hacks for cutting all that delicious summer fruit we love. And remember, see that QR code at the corner of your screen? You can use the camera on your smartphone to scan it for instant access to all the products on the show today. Or you can text shop to the number below to shop all the products we're sharing with you today. So let's get to it. So speaking of cute summer accessories, let's discuss this hat. It is the number one best-selling hat on Amazon and has over 25,000 reviews. So what makes it so great? Not only is this a great looking hat that can go with any summer outfit, according to the brand, it is also basically crush proof because it is designed to fold up and roll up easily so that you can toss it in your purse or your suitcase all summer long. If hats aren't for you, let's talk hair. In the summer, when the heat is on the rise, we all love to throw our hair into a ponytail to keep cool. So this set is going to be an essential for you. It comes in a set of 12 scrunchies for an incredibly affordable price. You get a ton of prints from florals, polka dots, even classic stripes so that you can match all of your summer outfits. And not only do they come in fun prints to match any outfit, but they have a cute scarf detailing attached to them to give your hairstyle a stylish little flair. Moving on to another accessory I'm a personal fan of, if I could only wear one pair of sandals all summer long, it would be the classic Birkenstock sandal. These are the brand's best-selling two-strap Arizona style. The brand says that this version is actually waterproof thanks to this rubber-like texture, which makes them incredibly lightweight. And they're perfect for all of those summer vacations, trips to the pool and the beach, or just a chill weekend in the backyard. Either way, you're still gonna get the support and comfort of a Birkenstock sandal with an adjustable buckle, and you can choose from a ton of different bright colors to jazz up any outfit. And with summer right around the corner, now is the perfect time to check those sunscreen expiration dates. You're gonna wanna stock up on new ones for those sunny days ahead. Today.com actually spoke with a dermatologist who recommends this very product. It also happens to be a favorite among the team. It's the CeraVe SPF 30 facial sunscreen that offers protection and doubles as a moisturizer, so there's no excuse not to use it daily. So we've covered style and your skin. Let's talk about the ultimate outdoor blanket because it is so large. It can fit up to three to five adults and you could use it anywhere from the beach to the park, even camping because according to the brand, it is waterproof and sandproof. It also weighs less than one pound and easily folds right back up into a carrying case that it comes with. And once you fold it up, it's about the size of a tablet, pretty small so you can pop it in your bag for on the go use. Plus, with all these bright colors to choose from, it's gonna be so easy to spot your crew from the beach. And it comes with four little anchors to keep home base in place. Speaking of home base, we found three incredible kitchen tools you're gonna wanna pick up if you're entertaining this summer. First, a handheld slicer that makes prepping some of the toughest fruit a lot easier. I'm talking about watermelons, honeydew and cantaloupe. It has a large round design with these sturdy handles that's gonna do all the heavy slicing for you. And we can't get over how this gadget is big enough for an average size watermelon. The trick is to cut your melon in half before you slice it to make it a little bit easier to slice up. If you're more of a pineapple lover, the stainless steel tool cuts perfect slices and does all the heavy lifting by removing the core for you. 
All you have to do is cut off the top of the pineapple, push down and twist all the way to the bottom to get those perfect slices. Once the core is pulled out, you can also use your now hollow pineapple for some festive drinks. Lastly, this strawberry slicer really cuts down on prep time, which is a game changer when you're hosting or you have hungry kids to feed. This little gadget is going to save so much time and you keep all your knives in the kitchen drawers. All you have to do is place the fruit inside of the gadget, give it a squeeze, and you're gonna get the perfect slices every time. It's actually designed for strawberries, but you can use it for grapes and other small fruits too. Let's run through the products one more time. The roll-up straw hat, the 12-piece scrunchie set, the Birkenstock Eva sandal, the CeraVe moisturizer with SPF 30, the beach blanket, the watermelon slicer, the pineapple core, and the strawberry slicer. And just so you know, today works with affiliate partners and earns a commission on purchases made through our links at today.com. And that's a wrap on editor's picks and for our show. It's been so much fun showing you all of our summer favorites. Tune in next week for an all new episode of Shop All Day. Thanks for watching. Sponsored by Walmart. Welcome to the Today All Day Kitchen. I'm Elena Besser. I'm Priyanka Knight. I'm Kevin Curry. And we're whipping up our favorite 30 minute meals for the Today Table. Don't get me wrong, I love spending time in the kitchen to unwind. But there are some days when you just want to get dinner on the table fast. So today we're making three speedy recipes that are just perfect for busy weeknights. I'm making a twist on falafel for all of you buffalo wing lovers out there. I'm making a savory stuffed French toast. I'm making chicken gyros that can be grilled up in a flash. Set your timer and set the table. It's time to get cooking. You can shop the ingredients featured here from our sponsor Walmart by scanning the QR code. Today earns a commission from purchases made through links on today.com. I absolutely love buffalo wings. I am so obsessed that I actually have a photo of wings hanging above my bed. Anyway, I also love the food and flavors from Israel. Half of my family lives there and I am always inspired by their cuisine. So today I am creating a mashup of my favorite foods, buffalo wings and falafel. The first thing I'm gonna do is jazz up my favorite hot sauce. So we are going to add in cubed butter to a saucepan over a medium heat. A nice gorgeous cup of hot sauce. You can use whatever favorite hot sauce you have on hand. And then for a little extra pizzazz, we are adding in some garlic powder. And we are going to whisk this together until all of that butter is melted and we have a nice gorgeously orange sauce. And this is going to happen very quickly. Okay, we will set this aside. And let's get going on our falafel. So to save time in this recipe, because we really wanna make sure that we keep it in the 30 minute mark, we are using canned chickpeas. I know this could be controversial, don't tell my cousins back in Israel. We're gonna start by pulsing these up. See that? It looks really nice and ground up. So we are transferring these back into the bowl from whence they came, and we will mix up the rest of our ingredients. Shallot. A shallot is awesome. It's kind of like a combination of an onion and garlic. It has those nice garlic notes in it. So we are going to rock our knife back and forth like so until we get about a tablespoon's worth of shallot. 
And this is gonna go into our creamy dill sauce, which is basically like a fun yogurt-based version of ranch. I'm a ranch gal. If you're a blue cheese person, feel free to add a little bit of blue cheese to that mixture. Pop it into a little bowl. With the rest of this, since it's all going into the food processor. So I've got my shallot. I got one clove of garlic. We are now going to add in some chili flake. And then we are also going to add in some parsley. And we are adding in more of my favorite, <laughs> the garlic powder. Hit it with a teeny bit of salt, a little bit of freshly ground black pepper. We're gonna give it a nice fine chop. But this is really giving us a gorgeous green color. It smells so fresh. Okay, so we're just gonna take this mixture and we are going to add it to our chickpeas. In order to make sure all of this falafel goodness binds together, we are going to add in some cornstarch. And then we are going to add in a little bit of baking powder to give it some lift. We're going to add some kosher salt as well. And then we are going to, again, fold this mixture together. I'm gonna go get a new pan so we can fry up our falafel. We are using neutral oil here. Pour that right into a heavy bottom skillet. I have a little scooper to help me create these into one ounce portions. You'll just kind of press that mixture into the cookie scoop. And then we're going to push it down. Okay, our oil is properly preheated. We have our falafel ready to rock. Let's fry these up. Make sure that you don't overcrowd the pan because we're going to want to move these around a bit as they cook. And we wouldn't be able to do that if it's too crowded in there. Even before I flip these, you can see how it is starting to get nice and golden brown on the edges. That is what we're looking for, and that is when we know we're getting really close to flipping these falafel. Ah, uh, yeah. Check that out. Now that these are done and draining on a wire rack, I'm gonna sprinkle them with some salt. And then I'm gonna fry up this next batch and when we get back, we will make our creamy dill sauce. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. You get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love you. I love you too. How many of you were up there? At least like 11. How real is this going back to the moon? <laughs> You get one beautiful life to live. What are you gonna do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm gonna go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the I way. Love riding. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. I love you. I love you too. <laughs> How many of you were up there? At least like 11. How real is this going back to the moon? Thank you, on Lester. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. NBC News, streaming free now. My falafel is all fried up and now I'm going to make a creamy dill sauce. Let's get into it. We have 
a beautiful cup of full fat Greek yogurt here. And we're just gonna take that minced shallot that we prepared earlier. We wanna add in the juice and zest of some lemon. Take any of that extra zest that's hanging out. We will slice this lemon in half and then citrus press, such a great tool. We are going to add in a little bit of kosher salt, some freshly ground black pepper. Just going to twist off those beautiful fronds of dill. We're looking for about two tablespoons of dill here. Add some garlic powder right on in. And because Greek yogurt tends to be on the thicker side, what I like to do is I like to add a little bit of room temperature water just to thin it all out and make it a more spreadable consistency for our pita. I love to create a little carrot salad to go with this. We're going to combine some dill pickles for a little extra brininess and some added crunch. We are just going to slice these into thin matchsticks. So we'll start by going lengthwise, really thin down those pickles. And we will take our knife and we'll just rock it back and forth to get these really nice thin strips of pickle. Put them into this big bowl here. And next up, it's carrot time. And we are going to start by just peeling the exterior off of these carrots, like so. So the next thing we're going to do is we're just gonna take our carrot and from top to bottom, we are going to slice these carrots into beautiful ribbons. Look at that, gorgeous. Add that to the bowl and just keep on going. Next up, we are going to add the juice of our lemon, just to bring out even more brightness in this salad that we're creating. We also wanna make sure that we add in our parsley, and we're going to bunch this on up and give it a nice, fine chop. It's almost time for dinner. Okay, season it with a little bit more kosher salt a little freshly ground black pepper, and then a nice drizzle of olive oil. So I'm just gonna give this a good toss. Beautiful. All of our components are done. I am ready to assemble the meze platter. Let's start with our carrot salad. So this is looking gorgeous. It is time to adorn our falafel in our sauce. So I'm just gonna take this sauce Take a brush and brush it right over the tops. And then we're gonna do a little flipperoo. Make sure we get them on both sides. We've been working so hard to do this, so it's time. Let's get after it. This is the best way to get that sauce in every bite. Then we're going to take a little bit of our salad, pop that in the bottom, take a couple of our little falafel nuggets. I'm gonna put three in there. Yeah, full house. A little bit more sauce in there. Oh my goodness. Check it out. Hold for sound effects. Mmm, wow, it is warm and crunchy and fresh from that salad. The buffalo is giving me the perfect amount of heat and that creamy dill, it just mellows it all out. I love this. I know your whole entire family is going to love this. I think when you open your eyes, you get to decide, how's my day going to be? We want to be a way to start your day, lighten your load, every single morning. How many of you were up there? I'm 
least like 11. How real is this going back to the moon? <laughs> Thank you, Ron Lester. This is what it looks and feels What's the latest film? The bigger piece to the puzzle. We begin tonight with breaking news. How much water ultimately will be forced inland? Whenever it happens, wherever you are. NBC News, streaming free now. How many of you were up there? At least like 11. How real is this going back to the moon? <laughs> Thank you, Lester. You get one beautiful so life to live. What are you gonna do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world to me. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm gonna go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the I way. Love riding. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. I love you. I love you too. <laughs> I think when you open your eyes, you get to decide, how's my day going to be? We want to be a way to start your day, lighten your load, every single morning. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. For Dateline Premium, subscribe now on Apple Podcasts. One of my favorite food memories is enjoying the spicy egg-coated toast my uncle and auntie would make for us on our annual family trips to India. They lived on a large farm, so everything we ate was incredibly fresh. When I went vegan, I wanted to recreate that experience, but without those farm fresh eggs. Well guys, I think I've cracked the code with this recipe for my savory Indian French toast. Let's start things off with the vegan batter. Okay, so first we're gonna dice up one small red onion. We're actually gonna just give these a fine dice and then we're gonna saute it up a little bit. So let's get our nonstick skillet on medium high heat. And while that heats up, we're gonna coat it with some neutral oil. So let's get these red onions in. It's exactly what you wanna hear. You want them to evenly cook throughout. This looks awesome, just wanna show you the coloring on this, they're nice and glossy. This is exactly what we want, so we're gonna turn the heat off and just let them sit. This is our next main component to the batter. So we're using Thai green chilies. I never de seed chilies, nor should you. So we're basically just gonna run our knife through this and give this a rough chop. Now that we've minced up our green chilies, we wanna get started on our batter. So we're using chickpea flour, which we call basin flour at home, which is simply ground dried chickpeas. And to this, we're gonna actually whisk in some water. And you wanna do this gradually because the chickpea flour can easily clump up. So our batter is looking good. The next ingredient that we wanna prepare are some dried spices. So in my mortar and pestle, I'm gonna add one of my favorite spices from my masala dubby, cumin seeds, or what we call jeera. So we're just gonna add the whole cumin seeds here. We're gonna take our pestle and we're gonna grind them down just to a rough grind. Okay, great, so we have a rough grind on our cumin, which is beautiful. So I'm gonna add that to our batter and we're gonna add our green chilies and we're gonna add some salt. And then we wanna add our sauteed onions. We're probably wondering, Priyanka, what is going on with the sauteed onions? Well, don't worry, they're waiting for us. So I'm gonna mix this up and you wanna be gentle when mixing it because you don't wanna break up the chilies and the onions in there. And we have one more ingredient to add to our batter some fresh coriander. This is gonna add a lot of freshness and brightness. We're gonna get it right into the batter. Give that a quick mix. And now it's time to start assembling our French toast. 
So I wanna show you the selection of cheeses I'm working with here because this is super exciting. Not only because one, these are all so delicious, but two, these are all vegan. So we have some smoked Gouda. Then we have a cheddar here, which honestly, this looks like an artisanal cheddar that you could probably get at some like fancy cheese shop, but it's vegan. All right, so to our bread, we're gonna add our cheese. I'm gonna do smoked Gouda in this one. We're gonna do two slices. We're gonna close her up, and then it's battering time. Take your bread, give her a nice dunk. Nice and coated. Okay, to our hot skillet, we're gonna get in some vegan butter. We want the butter to melt and get nice and bubbly, just like it is here. So you wanna see that nice sizzle on the edges and you'll see that it's starting to get golden. You could give it a little bit of a press to make sure that all sides of the bread are cooking evenly. We wanna cook our French toast for about five minutes on each side. It should be a nice golden brown color and that's when you'll know that the batter is cooked. This is looking fantastic. The color is great. You can see the cheese is melting. Feels crisp to touch, so we're gonna remove this bad boy. Let's build our second sandwich. So our sandwiches look amazing, but we still have some leftover batter, but we don't need to waste this because this is not like the traditional egg batter from a French toast. So we're actually gonna make my version of chewy, which are chickpea flour based pancakes. So we already have our skillet here. And to this, we're gonna add some neutral oil. We want a good amount of oil here because this is gonna be like a little bit like a shallow fry of the batter. Give these a flip. Beautiful. That's exactly what we're looking for, that golden brown. We have our French toast, we have our chewy pancakes, so I'm ready to serve everything up. So what I like to do is I like to take the French toast and cut it in half so we can reveal the beautiful inside. So first, we're gonna drizzle it with a traditional maple syrup. Now, this might sound weird, but the sweetness of the maple syrup goes really well with the spice. Kind of think of it like eating bacon with maple syrup, but this is not bacon. We're gonna add a little bit of chaat masala. So chaat masala is probably one of the most widely used spice mixes in India, and it has a bunch of different spices, like mango powder, which is a little bit tangy, black salt, which kind of has that umami salty flavor, cumin, coriander, so many things. And we're gonna add a little cheek of lemon because this is gonna add that freshness and brightness that's gonna go really well with every bite you take. There we have it. We're gonna take our French toast, I'm gonna do a little dunk. Oh my God. Mmm. It's like I never left India. The chilies, the coriander, they're so fresh and so vibrant. And I love the textures on this. And we did this all in just 30 minutes. How cool is that? Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. You get one beautiful life to live. What are you going to do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world to me. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm going to go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the I way. love ride. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Uh, yeah, I love that too. <laughs> You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. We begin tonight with breaking news just coming in. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. No stress, no mess, just yum. That's it. It's the best time of the morning. Time for oh, the pop star, baby. Oh, I'm feeling the vibe today on the show. 
Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. We begin tonight with breaking news just coming in. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. Gyros are an iconic Greek staple. Now traditionally, the meat is stacked on a vertical spit so you can get a, a mix of crispy and juicy meat pieces. Thankfully, for my version, you don't need a giant spit in your kitchen. <laughs> so my marinade is really simple. We're just gonna use a little bit of lemon. I'm gonna slice this. I'm gonna squeeze in some lemon juice. Squeeze it into a bowl. Also gonna be adding in some red wine vinegar. And then some personality for this, we're gonna keep it really simple and adding in some dried oregano. Pinch of salt and some fresh cracked pepper. Whisk this up. There you go. Now I'm gonna set this aside and we're gonna move on to our chicken breast. All right, so I'm gonna butterfly this chicken first just to get it a little bit thinner. And when we thin it out, you can have and much more even cooking throughout the chicken. Open it up and it makes a beautiful little heart just like this. So now, we're gonna flatten this out a little bit more. I'm gonna take some plastic wrap. I'm gonna add one of the pieces to it. I'm gonna use this mallet, it's a little bit easier. We're just gonna flatten it out. If you have a rolling pin as well for baking, use that. Again, we're just trying to flatten this out. This is not a contest that you're at the local fair trying to win a teddy bear for somebody. We're gonna add our piece of chicken right here to our marinade. So I'm gonna let this rest at room temperature, but you can also do this as a make-ahead recipe and do it overnight, but not too long because the chicken will come out mushy. Now you can't have a gyro without a creamy yogurt sauce, and here is my speedy one. So we're gonna line a bowl with some heavy-duty paper towels and grate this cucumber right into the bowl. And the reason we're doing this is cucumber is it's a whole lot of water. There we go, it looks just like this. Now, I'm gonna make this sweat just a bit by adding in a pinch of salt. Mm. Now we're gonna set this aside, let this rest, and then prepare the rest of our sauce. Starting off here with some thick Greek yogurt, super high in protein. We're gonna make this really bright today. <laughs> let this whole lemon. And then I am a garlic lover. I know I like a little bit of breast stink in my recipes, so I'm gonna use at least one, but if you use two, I would not be mad about that at all. Garlic adds a whole lot of flavor. Hit it with a splash of vinegar. Some red wine vinegar. I like dill, so I'm kinda heavy-handed with it. There we go. Pinch of sea salt. Some black pepper. And then we're gonna finish it off with some heart healthy olive oil. Again, this is my version. I don't want all the Greek grandmothers outside my door telling me, this is not right, Kev. No, this is just hero ish, tzatziki ish, okay? Mix this together. Don't worry, I have not forgot about our cucumber. We're gonna mix this first. Look at that. Beautiful, creamy sauce. Head back to check on our cucumber. Exactly what we want here, squeeze it. You don't have to go overboard here either. I mean, if you're squeezing so hard that it's tearing through the paper towel, it could either be the paper towel or it could just be you, Hercules. And now just fold everything together. Look how beautiful this is. Mmm, our tzatziki is looking really good. It's time to get our veggies. Now our grill pan is nice and hot. I'm gonna hit it with a little bit of avocado oil to spray, boom. I'm gonna take our chicken, shake off some of the excess marinade. In goes the chicken. We love that sound. Pinch of salt, just a little pinch, don't need much. So we're gonna cook this chicken for about four minutes on each side. Ready for the flip, here we go. One, two, three, flipping it over, boom. Look at that. Beauty, look at them grill marks, y'all. 
<laughs> and as it's finishing up, I'm just gonna squeeze a little bit more lemon on there. Just some citrus love. Ooh, look at that. Is it ready? And it lifts all the way up very easily. Boom. And if you need to, you can spray your grill pan just a little bit more. Shake off the excess marinade, and in goes the other piece of chicken. Now, keep this grill hot. I'm gonna do a light spray, some oil. Now, we still have the flavor from the chicken and the marinade there. I'm gonna put our pitas right on in there. Then gently press down, just to make sure it's not burning. We just wanna cook it long enough where there's a little bit of color on there. All right, this is really nice. I'm gonna turn off our pan. So we let our chicken rest for about five minutes, so now all those juices won't run out as we slice it up. And now it's time to build our sandwich. We got our fresh veggies here. We're making gyros, we're making gyros. Okay, so we're gonna open up our pita here. Gonna add in some of our creamy tzatziki. And then add in some lettuce, stuff it all the way up in there, get some tomato, a little bit of onion action here, and then don't forget the feta. It's like a double cream factor with the tzatziki. And then take our chicken, mm hmm and just load this bad boy up. Oh, wow. All right, this looks amazing. Can't wait to take a bite. Mm hmm I mean, if that was a mic, I'm dropping it right there. So darn easy, so darn delicious. Mm. Good Thursday morning. It is going to be a day of wild weather from coast to coast. It sure is. Al's tracking it all. It is February 16th. This is today. All over the map. Tens of millions in the path of severe storms and possible tornadoes in the south.